After his graduation from Bessel in the year 1980, he has honed his skills under great luminaries of orthopedics and sports surgery, like Professor Werner Muller, Professor Christian Gerber, Professor Freddie Fu, Professor J. P. Warner, and Professor Chris Warner, and many more. He is a distinguished member. of isicos esca secot german and swiss society of shoulder and elbow surgery he has to his credit many awards from various academic bodies across the globe like the ana malaysian argentine indian and german arthroscopy societies he is on the editorial board of arthroscopy journal journal of shoulder and elbow surgery ajsm casta and many more he has published numerous articles in various index journals to his credit till 2020 were 484 articles he has edited around 37 books and the 41 years of experience professor i am of he is going to sum up and present his experience to us now welcome to you professor and i am of over to you thank you very much i am so honored and yeah what shall, what shall i say i'm just nice that i can be here with you um and i know 40 years of my life spent with orthopedic surgery Now I try to bring you some new insights about the AC joint. So I try to bring you the slides. Okay, I hope you can see it. Can you see it now? Yes, professor, we can see it. Wonderful. So that's Munich, and you see in the back of Munich the the Alps, the Bavar the German Bavarian and Austrian Alps. You have still a little bit of snow. because this winter was quite hard but a lot of old buildings are in the middle of the town of munich so ac joint where are we today i will tell you a little bit of biomechanics in the back uh, the new isocos classification my experience arthroscopically since 2003 when i started to do it arthroscopically these are my disclosures with arthrex auto surface and medi and we just start with a case you see now 23 year old female sports science student she had a acute grade 4 ac joint dislocation while snowboarding and you see the translation of the clavicle posteriorly a little bit higher but it mainly posterior so a horizontal instability she got some surgery somewhere not in my hospital with two tight rope system it's not so bad you see the two tunnels here two plates here underneath the coracoid on the first we view it's not so bad but then 3 months later she fall down on a stair and now it dislocated again what shall we do now you see now it's dislocated in the horizontal plane but in the vertical plane the plates are still here so something must happen so we did a ct scan the clavicle tunnels are not so bad two tunnels maybe a little bit too close it's not anatomic um but on the coracoid side you see now the problem two tunnels are in the same space confluating too big now that's why these as pieces as metal pieces as dog bones went into the bone and that's why it was not stable so what shall we do next so it's a recurrent instability it's chronic what shall we do now now we go back a little bit to anatomy um you see the the lateral clavicle the ac joint capsule the fascia around two ligaments two distinct ligaments the conoid it's more for, for the vertical stability and trapezium for the horizontal stability So we have dynamic stabilizers and static stabilizers. Static means these two ligaments they are static, and dynamic are mainly the muscles, delta muscle, trapezium muscle. 
So when we look for the stability here, when we transect the capsule, we have different parts of the capsule. We need them for horizontal and um, rotational stability. It's also some rotation in this joint. That's why it's so difficult to keep to keep it. When you look here to the rotation, you see how much it's possible. That's why it's so difficult to stabilize. And when you look to the insertion side on the coracoid, here's for trapezium, here's the conoidium. At the base, the coracoid is quite big. It's about nine, cent, nine millimeter. But here at the edge, what trapezium is, it's only between five and seven, so it's quite small. So when you drill two tunnels, be careful, otherwise the coracoid will break. And then these are really important landmarks for the, these two ligaments, 2.5 for the coroidium, 4.5 for the prisium. So you can measure from the AC joint to the medial side where it should be, and this is published in HSM. Um, to find the correct insertion site, sometimes it's difficult. The yeah, conditions are sometimes difficult. We did a systematic review. It's in the BMC published. There is not really a consensus on the gold standard. So the intra-observer reliability for, especially for the vertical stability is quite low. And that's why maybe we have so, so bad results. So keep an eye on the horizontal stability. That's much more important than anything else. So finding the correct diagnosis, in this case, it's easy. It's Rockwood 5, 20 year old male. That's quite easy. You see it, you compare left to right, it's quite easy. But here, this is not easy. When you look at it, I and mean, when you look closer now on the AP view, it's almost normal if you compare. But here, when you look from a different angle, then you see that's horizontal, horizontal instability. So you need more specific imaging technique to really understand it. And then the second biggest problem is the scapular dyskinesia. The function of the scapular thoracic joint is the key of the shoulder. And when we studied this in 34 patients with chronic AC chain dislocation, about 70% had a dyskinesia. So always look from the backside of the, of the patient, look from the backside, how is moving his shoulder. And then you understand that how important the clavicle, how important the AC joint is. So when you have it, start first, uh, looking from the backside to understand what is it? Is it a grade three or the grade four? And the Rockwood grade three, it's more difficult to understand because you don't see it from the first view of the X-ray. Um, these patients, they don't need always surgery. If they have pain and a dyskinesia and the cross-body adduction view, Basmania or Alexander view can show it quite nicely. And if there's an overriding of the discal clavicle, then that's what we call type 3B. And this there's a need for surgery. It's no overriding. You can continue non-operative surgery. And that's the so-called Isocos classification now published in Atroscopy 2014. And there is the shoulder committee of Isocos published this. Now, how we do it? This is my current atroscopic technique and it goes quite fast through. We have two portals, one anterior with a passport cannula, a second portal under superior through the supraspinatus, as you can see here, um, where we have the, the camera now. And then we look from the side, from the lateral side, underneath the coracoid, we have two small incision, one incision just above the AC joint, one a little bit medial. We pull and we drill through the acromion, cr the clavicle, just for the horizontal stability, a cross link, but we do not fix the knot, just the perpendicular, just a, 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 a fixation for some time before we start the drilling for the CC ligaments. These are new drills, 2.4 cannulated, so it's quite easy, small drills. And then we can place the dog bone underneath and above the clavicle. And this is the final view. And then we fix the circlage for the AC joint. So this cross show, we go now a little bit more slowly through everything. Again, you, you need two portals to prepare here, the undersurface of the coracoid, especially the base of the coracoid with an electrothermal device. And then we drill because now it's easy. Do you know that the clavicle is a little bit higher? So it makes it easier to make two drills 
uh, two holes with a 2.4 drill guide where we can use um, a fiber tape going through. And here's a lasso together with a fiber tape. We just uh, put this down, keep this with a clamp like here. And before then we have everything stable, we can control it with the X-ray control until we are sure that it's stable and the correct position before we start now drilling the coaxial part. And then finally, these are two types, one dog bone underneath. Um, and you look with your camera underneath the concrete, you can place the, the button quite nicely here. And at the base, that's for the conoid. Conoid is important for both for horizontal and vertical stability. Let's see, yes. Now you pull the, the fiber tapes and the second um, dog bone is above the clavicle. And then because we already have the reduction, we can just use the normal knots. And when you have a chronic system, you use the same system here. I had two systems now, but I need in addition a gracilis tendon like here, the white here, going around the concrete, around the clavicle, because we need some soft tissue, we need some tissue for healing in the chronic case. So we can combine this technique with the gracilis tendon. You see the schematic drawing here. You see here the two systems here, two tight ropes. And finally, the gracilis is going together with one of the system underneath the, the concrete. And now we have one system here for the fixation mainly. And the second is the gracilis going through the the second tunnel, the, the tunnel for the gracilis is a four millimeter tunnel. So the gracilis has enough space to go in through. Now you see the fine laparoscopic part here. On the right side, you see the gracilis tendon now coming from the lateral side through the concrete. So we have a tendon bone to bone healing, bone to tendon healing, final view. Sorry, that was too fast. That's a final view now. You also can use a temporary fixation with a key wire. In chronic cases, it's quite helpful because it keeps you the, the stability as long as you do everything laparoscopically. Just use a key wire um, and then you can do everything that you would do. Um, the additional cerclage for the AC joint has a lot of biomechanical advantage for horizontal and rotation stability. This is a study we did also in published in HSM. Together, together with plasma soccer, as you see now, when you fix it with AC joint, we have really an additional benefit. Suture pulley system demonstrated excellent results. Two bundle contraction, that's a five year result, follow up for five years, 96%, were very satisfied. Return to sports, return to activity is almost normal, especially in overhead or contact sports observed. So no significant change. So I can just tell you that this technique is working and we have in, our, in, the, in the patients quite good results. Also biomechanically, quite good results. We did several published, several studies and published this in HSM several times, KST also biomechanical evaluation, different holes. So I can, this technique is really proven. So finally, our case from the beginning, what I did, I did again the same, the same technique now, but I drilled more medial, more at the base of the core grid because the bone is still intact. One big suture button here, uh, a new tunnel, fixed it. And you see now she's doing the sports again. Sometimes if the bone is broken or you think the hole is too big, you can use a lateral clavicle plate as I did here. In this case, there's a small curved clavicle plate and the button just flips into one of the hole, and then you have more pressure against the bone. You are on the safe side, so it doesn't matter. You have enough pressure, um, you can use this. And underneath, also different possibilities. You can use different plates, bigger plates, because we are coming from the side. You don't need a big hole for a bigger plate. Coming from the side, place it correctly. You can use two dog bone and fiber tapes and this is the final X-ray. Now in this case, you see when you have big holes here, maybe sometimes it's better to use a small blade, lateral clavicle blade. The same technique for a lateral clavicle fracture. 
because it's it's more stable than just the plate alone if you have the compression to the coracoid. These are the take home message. You understand that the AC joint is very important for the 3D motion of the scapula. The scapular thoracic motion is important. Um, there's no gold standard still, but I can tell you now after 20 years that we have really good results. Um, anatomic techniques is most favored technique. Internal bracing is wonderful. And we use a biological graft. Otherwise, um, our technique, our, the, the, the tapes will break sometimes. So thank you very much. And I'm open for any kind of questions. Thank you, Professor Ayama, for uh, your eloquent lecture on uh, this topic of, uh, you know, very uncertain uh, uh, results because uh, there are new and newer techniques that are coming up to, you know, really stabilize this joint, which is both horizontal as well as rotationally unstable. Uh, I would ask uh, Subra and other members in the panel if they have any questions for Professor Ayama. Hi, Professor Andreas Amo. Hi, this is Dr. Subramanian. Hello. That was a very nice lecture. I think you covered everything. Um, I have a couple of questions for you. One is, uh, what is the threshold for doing ACJ fixation on top of CC fixation? When do you decide on to go for acromic labular joint fixation also on top of doing uh, uh, corpo labular fixation? That's number one. And then... Okay. Uh, the plate that you were showing, was it plate going towards acromion also? That is the second question. Yeah, um, this is just a, a normal plate for the lateral clavicle, but you have seen it has a special curvature, so it, it makes it easy. You can use additional screws for when you have a broken clavicle, the smaller screws, self-locking screws. Um, so this plate is wonderful for lateral clavicle fractures, but we always have revision cases and sometimes the bone is too weak. So that's why we can use a plate like that. And then you can use the, the bracing through the coracoid because then you can reduce the stress on the AC joint itself. You don't have to go to the acromion. The acromion can, yeah, the AC joint itself can be still open. And that's why it may help healing of the lateral, especially small fractures, small pieces of the lateral clavicle may be so difficult to keep this. Um, so that's just another technique, just a solution. And the first question, um, in the beginning, when I started to doing atroscopically, I had to use some um, suture anchors in the coracoid. I used sutures going through clavicle. I said, okay, that's enough. I do it. And the results were not so bad. But then we did this biomechanical stuff and we could understand that it's important to give them more horizontal stability. That's why we added this bracing for the AC joint in addition to CC, but CC is the most important part. Doctor, Thank you. Do you have any questions? Dr. Malikarjun, do you have any questions for Professor Aymoff? We have some audience question. Uh, if you can look into it, uh, one of them is asking what is the post-op rehab protocol after the surgery? Okay. Professor Aymoff, yeah. what is your Thank rehab you. protocol? Yes. Uh, you know, this technique is not very painful. It's mainly atroscopical and we do not open some joints. So these people, they don't have a lot of pain. This is the biggest problem we have. So we have to keep them a little bit. Um, I give them a, um, a sling just for comfort for about three weeks. They shouldn't do external rotation, overhead activities like that for the first three, four weeks. These people, they are sports athletes, they want to do everything. And because they say, they stand in, the, in front of the mirror and they say, oh, it's nice, I can do everything, but they shouldn't. We need some time for healing. So anyway, it's a bracing, it's stable, no pain, but keep, keep them calm. They shouldn't do too much for the first three, four weeks. Professor, I have a question for you. I have seen you, um doing the single dog button and also I have seen you doing uh, double buttons, two tunnels in the clavicle, two tunnels in the coracoid. Now understanding the anatomy of uh, the uh, uh, space that you uh, come from and our uh, anatomy in our country, 
there will be a huge difference to take uh, two tunnels in the coracoid and uh, you rightly put the most complicated uh, problem in your uh, acg surgery as the first slide if such a thing happens when you are trying to do this dog bottom kind of a thing how what is the bailout for that that is number 1 number 2 currently we are addressing the rotational problem that is influencing the outcome of acg surgeries uh, i know uh, you are working along with dr mazoka and the team and all on a lot of uh, papers we go through that currently your understanding is the posterior capsule of the ac joint has got more to do with the ac joint instabilities that uh, you are looking at so your current thoughts as well as how to bail out of the situation <clears throat> yeah rotational stability is so important that's why now we understand more about the different part of the capsule of the ac joint itself so the posterior part superior part are really important and that's why when you make a small incision you have your brace box brace or, or cross like braces and then we use the capsule and cover everything together so we have a secure fixation of the ac joint but it's still not stiff there's still some little motion possible because when you move your arm you know that then you have always a little bit of rotation so that's important um Um, and the second question is about revision cases. In most all cases, in almost all cases, I had the possibility um, to place my tunnel more posterior at the base of the coracoid because when you really have drilled posteriorly, the coracoid will not break. The, the coracoid breaks always in the middle part where you know when the coracoid is like this, it will break here. So when you go here at the back, rear and the back, there's almost all, all the time enough. bone if not you still can use a plate and i have this experience to use a blade a bigger blade going from the clavicle to the acromion but that's not anatomy um i don't use a hook plate anymore this because there are so much um forces on the hook itself that the hook will go sometimes through the acromion it's just a question of time um we need something really fixation to the base of the coracoid And in the beginning, in 2002, 2003, and 4, I used just a corkscrew at the base of the coracoid in the in the supraspinatus fossa. That's another possibility. It's like in the tradition of the Boswell screw, where we put our screws just directly at the base of the coracoid. Another possibility, but Boswell screw doesn't work because it's it's stiff, doesn't allow your rotation. So these screws will break and will loosen anyway. subra you have got any questions dr malik arjun if you got any questions for professor uh, so we have some questions from the audience uh, yes they want to know about the arthroscopic uh, coracoid exposure that's one question and uh, some other persons want a more uh, description on the dog bone procedure so do you have time to take this yeah yes we start the procedure with a normal arthroscopy of the shoulder going the normal posterior portal and then we switch to the lateral side so you need at the end two portals on the lateral side supralateral and posterolateral because you must have the possibility to, to look underneath the coracoid and you need two portals because you you need your uh, scope and the electrotherm device that you can clean everything you are just in the line of the subscap So it's the same way when you do a subscap repair. I always switch my scope to a lateral side to see my subscap, subscap in line. So it's a, the same way to see the coracoid. And between subscap and coracoid, it's only a small bursa. It's easy to open it and to go underneath. And there are no vessels, no nerves around. Coracoid is free. You can just see it nicely, and you can prepare it. And yeah, maybe in the beginning you feel it, but then you see. um how big it is how big medial is is and the new drill guides they have a stop so we can hook it in medially and in is you make can measure the distance 9 10 mm before you drill through the coracoid and the second question was about the system um you can yeah, use any kind of tapes i use uh, fiber tapes because they are very strong two ty two types correctly 
and you can use any kind of blade because since we have these small drills, 2.4, um, it's easier and you don't have to drill a big holes. In the beginning, in really beginning, I had to drill four and five millimeters and that's too dangerous. That's why we do this. We do this not anymore. Um, that's maybe a reason for breakage of the coil grid. Uh, Professor, I have one, one question here for you. Uh, we are all graduated from being uh, open uh, procedure surgeons to being arthroscopy surgeons. Uh, in the current scenario, what is the role for open procedures in AC joint surgeries? And how do you address deltotrapezial fascia in arthroscopic procedures? Two questions. Yeah. <clears throat> so the trapezium... The fascia is quite important. That's why we open now the AC joint itself, a small incision, and at the at the end we close the AC joint after bracing with the fascia itself. Because I agree completely, the fascia is very important. So at the end, just close it. That's not that's open, but everything else between coracoid and clavicle that's arthroscopy, and I never open an AC joint anymore because it's much easier. I tell you, it's much easier if you go in with your atrosc with the atroscopy underneath. When you do it open, you know, when I was a resident, we went in like this and the surgeon said, oh, here's the, here's the ligament. I see it, I see it. I can take it and fix it, but it didn't work. It didn't work really because it's, it's a small ligament. It doesn't work. So I really can recommend, try it atroscopically. It's not, it's not difficult. Subra, you have any questions for Professor? I think there are a few questions in the chat box. Yeah. You want to add, ask one or two in that at least, huh? so that yeah. the audience will be happy. Yeah. One of them, they have, will you add a K wire always? When will you remove the wire? I think uh, you probably won't add K wire, would you? Professor Emma? Um, I didn't understand it, sorry. Oh, no, you K wire for the position? Keshner wire? Do you stabilize the AC joint with the Kushner wire? Yes, correct. Especially in chronic cases where you are, where it's more difficult to reduce it. It makes your life easier when you reduce it, look under your fluoroscopic device, bring your key wire from, from the acrylam to the clavicle. It makes it much easier because then it's stable and you can um, drill everything. And then at the end, you take it out and that's it. Now, how do you deal with a broken coracoid? Another question. Yes, um, just go more posterior at the base of the coracoid. Then there's always enough bone because the bone is quite large at this insertion to the to the scapula. Otherwise, you also can use a screw, corkscrew, or something like that, and fix it to the bone. Can you see there's a question about how much tightness would you apply when tightening graft? Would you just put a finger pressure or would you use? No, just, just reduce it and keep it in this position. Um, no more tightness, no. Sir, when is the return to sport for an elite athlete or a recreational athlete? Is there a difference between both or they return at the same time? Yeah, the main time we need is healing. Healing is six weeks. And then after six weeks, they can start the training. Um, contact after three months, like ice hockey or something like that. After three months, overhead, again, three months. But it's the same for everybody. But after six weeks, they can start the training. Um, I understand you have got one more talk to give. That is what was told to me. No, no, no. no, no. We're going with the case presentation, uh, Dr. Rajkumar. You, are, you and Dr. Subramanian can present some cases for discussion. Okay. Um, if any more questions are not there for Professor Imhoff, uh, I'll ask Subramanian to present his case and then uh, okay. Professor can moderate and uh, we'll take it forward. Dr. Malik Arjun also can moderate. Take I just have only one case to show. We'll yes. just fix it. Please share your screens. Are you able to see the screen? Yes. So I just let's see whether I can put the play mode. 
before subra can start i would like to thank professor aima for his wonderful lecture and the time given for oasis con and uh, we really appreciate uh, uh, your presence in this august meeting sir thank you thank you i have this case you know who i came across like uh, a few months ago is young lad who is only 19 to 20 his age was who came with this uh, fall and had a dislocation it was operated somewhere else so what will be your uh, next line of action on seeing this x ray one of the panel can uh, answer maybe the pros i am of what will be your management for this patient who is presenting with this x ray yes okay thank acute you in acute thank scenario you. but you see there is a distance between clavicle and acromion so it's a uh, it's a instability but we need more information about in which kind this is unstable is horizontal or or in the vertical plane so we need at least a second or third view from the lateral and axial view and if it's acute it's okay otherwise if it's chronic think about a ct scan or mri to see additional um, problems around a, a c joint Just want to make sure any other panel members any disagreement with uh, going for further investigation, or we all just go manage with X-ray, or do you want to do a CT scan, MRI scan, anything? I think we need. Yeah, we have audience question. What is the specific X-ray you look for the in the AC joint? You elaborate on that. Anyway, um, I I did not have this patient at the outset. It was managed elsewhere. It was had a KV fixation done. He did not have a CT scan or MRI scan. that stage um what is your opinion on this fixation what is the chance of it uh, getting through without any problem yeah the, the problem will be the healing why and how should this heal if you if you use a, a, a precise uh, preparation you use the fascia the pissing fascia that will be okay but anyway you cannot you cannot expect that the cc ligaments will heal because they are destroyed when they have a dislocation like that so they will have a little bit of of translation superiorly when you take out the key wires and the key wires must be taken out after 6 weeks otherwise um they go through the skin um i i miss something between the coracoid and the clavicle Uh, well, would it, probably it was a type five dislocation. We did not have a scan or MRI to start with. Uh, for a type three, you might probably do a K wire. For a type five, uh, what will be the line of management? Would you think about? Would you do a button fixation? Yes. That's what you would do. Isn't it? Yeah, correct. So uh, we had a K wire removal done about uh, uh, two months later. I think uh, the X-ray doesn't look that bad, as you can see in this. It looks reasonably reduced. And uh, looking at the literature for the audience is uh, comparing tightrope and caver fixation. Tightrope is actually does well in in terms of failure rate, where uh, the studies, the multiple studies, have shown that um, uh, the caver will have about 15 to 20 percent failure rate. That's what uh, the roughly indicated uh, percentage of. Uh, Failures in caver fixation, only caver fixation. If you do a tight rope or any button kind of fixation, the failure rate is not zero; still about nine to ten percent. That's what it is. So in uh, first month itself, after taking the caver out, this patient had started having pain. Now he is coming to me with this re-dislocation again. Uh, just want to know your thoughts about it. What will be the plan of management at this scenario? Now he is now about seven months down the line since he had the. Uh, Caver removal, and is uh, again is same pain and not able to do his shoulder activity comfortably. He is only twenty years old, chap. So he wants to have a perfectly normal shoulder. That's what his expectation is. So what will be the uh, line of thinking, and what would he like to do? This is a chronic neglected ACJ dislocation currently. Professor, your thoughts on that? Professor, I'm off. There is. There was no really healing. That's why it dislocated again. Um, you need some soft tissue. You need some biological arms so that they can heal AC and CC. 
Um, first, you can bring back the clavicle to the coronal, that's okay, but you need an addition fixation between coracoid and clavicle. You can use a, a figure of eight cerclage between clavicle and coracoid, but also some refixation bracing of the AC joint itself to give him back the stability. Rajukumar, what is your view? Professor, I have a question for both the both Subramanian and Professor Raimov. You said circlage. Circlage will be in the form of a, a fiber tape or some kind of a suture, or you want to use a, a graft so that either semi or gracilis to augment your uh, repair. Yeah, do, but we need some augmentation with some sutures, strong sutures or uh, bands, it's maybe better because it doesn't cut through. And then second, you need some biological tendon, gracilis, semi-tendinos, uh, semi something like that. Uh, otherwise it will not heal. It will cut through again, it will dislocate again. And you can use just a gracilis because gracilis is about 28 centimeters long. You can use it for the coracoid, a clavicle, but also between clavicle and acromions, you can use it for both, it's long enough. But for the, first, for the first six weeks or 10 weeks, you need some additional bracing. The graft itself is not strong enough. The problem with this patient was, uh, I usually try to manipulate clinically and see whether you are able to reduce it. And it was not reducible at all. So I had a strong feeling any kind of just tape fixation may not just work because it's not reducible. So you need, definitely have to open it and uh, try to release all the uh, delta trapezial fascia, and then only you can reduce it. So that kind of situation was there. Okay. Uh, even by holding it also, it was just coming back again like a spring. So um, my th gut feeling was, um, even if I do an augmented graft, uh, will it stay there along with button? That's what my gut feeling. Okay. So I, I went into do hook plate fixation. Uh, where I also put a ST graft using two tunnels, you can see over there. Yeah. For conoid ligament and another for trapezoid, two tunnels, and uh, reduced it and put a plate on top of that for additional fixation. But that is the only way you can try to keep it holding. So, yeah, great. It looks nice. But the problem is, will be, you will see when you take out the plate, and you have to take out the plate sometimes. Yes, I think I uh, well understood. Every hook plate has to come out, and especially in a 20 euro old boy, we cannot leave it. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> Just to quickly run through the, this is a patient, he is now about uh, uh, five to four to five months after the surgery, and he is fine. Mm -hmm. Just to run through the literature, we see the every technique, every technique has got a reference of dislocation date, like from both so screw, emission technique, tight group and uh, if you see the particle button where there is 23.1 percent failure rate if you look into the literature none of them has got a near zero complication rate everyone has written about acute patients if we compare the chronic also there are 25 percent failure rate and should be aware of it is that uh, chronic cases are not easy one to manage they are difficult to manage and radiographic failures and rate of reoperation, as uh, Professor Raimo was suggesting, anatomical reconstruction of CC along with button and allograft or uh, some type of augmentation, it will uh, that's better than uh, just doing without augmentation. So if you are doing it, do augmentation for sure. Otherwise, the uh, chance of failure is much less in much, much higher in a chronic scenarios. And uh, there's only one study which I came across where they compared hook plate with augmentation, without augmentation, where they have, uh, they have seen that augment with augmentation, the failure rate is much lower and they have a better outcome. So I think uh, to conclude, what I would say is chronic cases are always a challenge. Logical augmentation is definitely essential in a chronic case and robust fixation will help for keeping it steady. But if you are doing a hook plate, take the plate out after a few months time once the AC joint heals. Thank you. Thank you, Subra, for your nice presentation. I just have one question for you. Uh, you yeah. used the graft as well as the plate. It was looking very eloquent on the uh, image. 
uh, i just want to ask you did you cross the graft under the clavicle or there was no crossing of the graft it was just a loop no two tunnels through the clavicle and uh, superior septic in the clavicle has got those bo- both graft tightened hmm. with stitch and then plate is put on top of them professor do you do differently such chronic cases or do you cross the graft under the clavicle and then take it to the tunnels over the clavicle through the clavicle Uh, congratulations to this technique it's wonderful and looks nice um i i think that tunnels in the clavicle are important that we will have a healing tendon to the bone so i think that was just perfect if you can do that don't use the graft over the ta- over the the plate because you have to remove the plate and you won't you won't cut through the tendon again so through the clavicle congratulations wonderful Uh, thank you subra uh, vamshi any questions from the floor that you would want to ask uh, subra while fixing the ac joint do you ever reduce a little more uh, because the graft touches that's one of the questions professor and uh, subra any thoughts on that what is the question say it again i missed it no do you uh, while fixing the ac joint do you over reduce it little more uh, because the graft eventually stretches yeah. uh no i don't over reduce it you reduce it to the, if i am using hook plate then there is no question of that but if you are using other type of fixation like button you don't over reduce it you just keep it to the joint level exactly yeah but we have seen now after 5 years and longer that the clavicle is going up a little bit maybe 1 mm or so so but it doesn't matter it doesn't matter for the anatomy for the biomechanical function it doesn't matter now we don't over reduce it professor can i ask you um how long do you keep this hook plate inside and what is the longest that you have kept a hook plate and what damage it has caused to the under surface of the acromion and the cup <laughs> <laughs> no, because I have got the longest uh, number of years of experience in shoulder and elbow surgery. Please check the. So we are just novices. So would like to hear from the master. <laughs> yeah, that's why I dis- I dis- uh, uh, I suggest that you take it out after six seven weeks because before before you start all rotation in the clavicle when you before you use your shoulder normally. because i have seen many cases really many cases where the hook is going migrating through the acromion because when you do it every day like this here it goes through the bone and this is really bad when you have the hook somewhere what shall you do then acromion osteosynthesis is one of the worst thing you imagine <laughs> So one more question is regarding the ac joint uh, arthrodesis is it a option in a chronic uh, dislocations arthrodesis as an option in chronic dislocations professor any yeah. thoughts on that i don't have any experience uh, on that i have never done arthrodesis for a acromic clavicular joint so i don't know answer i had to do it because somebody take out a chromion and then i had to use some bone graft to, re- to re- <laughs> rebuild the acromion so i had to go from the clavicle to the spine of the scapula but that's not something you like because it doesn't give you it give you back some kind of mobility in your arm you can move the arm to 45 550 degree but no rotation no 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 don't do that no no mm, dr rajkumar so olden days people used to exercise the lateral end of clavicle and nowadays i know it is condemned but still you feel it is old school whenever all the procedures are failed yes yes <laughs> simple question yes <laughs> yes <laughs> so that is the answer from the professor himself you can still do as a salvage procedure excision of the distal end of the clavicle to you know salvage your ac joint and that's how we can manage chronic and neglected cases having said that in the literature probably there are experiences uh, Uh, like uh, john tokesh and his group who have done enormous studies in uh, even military recruits who have got grade 3 acj dislocations without surgery being done 
so that is other spectrum of you know treating patients without surgeries so yes with and without surgery both options are there you need to choose uh, uh, based on uh, what suits you so without wasting much time i would like to share my screen and uh, just uh, present two cases in front of you for discussion and uh, for learning Uh, it is showing that host has disabled my screen i can't uh, share my screen <laughs> or oh, try again sir try again huh try try again. Again. Try, try, try again now try again okay i'll try yes it is uh, showing and uh, find uh, okay go for share screen mode yeah we can see that you can see the presentation that you just may yes can see your screen okay, not this sorry yeah. Yeah, can you see the screen well you can see the screen but we are not able to see that uh, presentation yet now not yet Uh, this one share okay no you can you can double click that for yeah now you can see yes, you can see you can see but can yeah. okay sorry for the technical glitch and i am professor uh, rajkumar from bangalore and i um, will present two case short cases which are uh, acute and uh, probably it will be of great interest for learning for all the crowd who are watching this webinar um this is a young gentleman who came to us with uh, this problem in his shoulder uh, he was actually uh, white washing uh, during a christmas eve and he fell down uh, in his house and uh, came to us 3 weeks post the problem you can see that his right side is showing uh, a grade 3 dislocation of the ac joint and he wanted to get back to his uh, he is a marketing executive and uh, he wanted to get everything right for his shoulder so we did uh, i think the wrong presentation has opened okay we did uh, open ac joint reconstruction for him and this is his result at the end of 7 years and this is the zanka view that we have taken uh, sorry um, can i uns unshare the thing and come with the proper presentation i'm sorry you can you can can give me a second something is wrong i'm not sure okay. yeah okay mm Oh, you are on. I will just uh, ask yes, something. Yes. yes, you can ask some questions while well, I am just trying to do this. So, sir, I am off. Uh, are we still doing uh, we were done procedure? No, 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 no. Because it's not anatomic, and you reduce the length of the clavicle, so you you bring the scapula a little more anterior, and that's why I don't like that. I know there are still some people doing that. 
Biomechanically, the Vivadan is not strong enough to keep the clavicle. It's only 150 Newton. And the normal value of the CC is 550. So it's far away from that. So if you do Vivadan, you need some additional fixation between coracoid and clavicle, some type, tapes or something else. Some uh, otherwise the clavicle is going up and you don't give the stability we need when you try to do some overhead activities, throwing a ball, something like that. When you use the scapula going back and forth, you need this so-called strut function where you can see when you sit back on the, the backside of the patient, you see how the, the scapula is winging around. So that's why I do not recommend it. Yes, we're not doing it yet. One more question in the question box. In uh, pediatric age group, uh, do you feel always conservative management? That is the one question of my audience. Yeah. Um, it's very rare that you see in, in children until 15, some AC joint dislocations, very rare. So I agree, I would always start uh, with a non-surgical treatment. Can you see the screen? Yes. 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 Okay. Our goal is actually to create a repair as good as the original. <laughs> so this was the man, uh, forty-year-old dominant right-handed marketing executive, fell at home during a Christmas Eve, as I told you. Came to us with pain and limitations of his activities of daily living. This was the X-ray taken and the CT scan you have already seen. And this is a procedure that we planned for him. A semi-T graft with anatomical tunnels augmented with the fiber tape. And uh, you can see that the graft is being tunneled through the uh, clavicle. And there is a crossing over of the graft on the clavicle and not under the clavicle. That is what the question I was asking the August gathering. And the graft is sutured after passing it through the AC joint. And you can see that the patient is quite happy at the 10th post-operative day. Having said that, we all would like to know how the patient is performing. He came back to us uh, after seven years from Australia. And he was a happy guy, though he has grayed a bit. You can see that the clavicle and the acromion is well reduced there. And this is his function for you to see. I won't mute the audio because uh, the type of background music that is there for his uh, AC joint is good. <laughs> that is the functional recovery the patient has got. And probably that is quite a good amount of recovery for his, uh, not only being a marketing executive, listening to his wife and cutting the wood for his winter, uh, uh, this thing. And this is another gentleman who is a 38 year old, a manual laborer, came to us with uh, a grade three acromaclavicular injury. And we performed a similar procedure for him using a semi-T grout, but he comes to us at the end of two years of follow-up. You can see that uh, on the screen, there is a slight prominence of the clavicle here. And when we take a Bosmanian view, we can see that the clavicle is overriding the acromion. But if you uh, look how we performed the procedure, it was the same augmentation was done again using the semi T. Anatomical tunnels were drilled in the clavicle. The graft was sutured over itself. But I want you to concentrate on the type of crossing over that we have done here. It is from the um, uh, conoid part to the acromion, we have crossed the soft graft, and then we have sutured these two grafts together. And this is his functional outcome. If you can see that he can do his overhead activities quite uh, uh, okay. When he does his uh, shoulder movements and we take the full arc of the shoulder movement, you can say that there is some amount of dyskinesia on his involved shoulder here, which is very prominent. <clears throat> if I can look again at the X-ray closely, you can see that the uh, tunnels that are drilled are healed well, but there is a beaking of the clavicle at this end. And when you cross over, you can still see that the clavicle is not well reduced to the acromion. 
having said that his functional recovery is much better and is back to his working uh, uh, place which is our hospital itself the pearls that you can take home from an anatomic reconstruction is your incision has to be close to the close and medial to the coronary tubercle the tunnels for the trapezoid ligament should be vertical and the distance from where you drill the anatomical tunnels should be 2.5 cm for the trapezoid and 4 cm from the lateral end of the clavicle and a small tunnel should be good when you use grafts because they should you should really struggle to get the grafts out through the tunnels crossing over of the graft is a important phenomena that i need to uh, tell you here because the liver arm should be very small because the graft will stretch out over a period of time and you will see that the clavicle will sit up even after crossing amallikarjun sir was asking should we excise the clavicle or not uh, there are a lot of proprioception uh, uh, receptors at the end of the clavicle as well as in the ac joint so unless required you don't excise the clavicle because it provides a good amount of stability to the ac joint confirm your reductions on the x ray and give adequate physiotherapy uh, welcome to india professor i am off thank you very much for your patient listening Oh, thank you, Dr. Rajkumar. Uh, I think we are out of time. Can we go to the next session? Do you have any questions to Dr. Hemoff? Uh, Sir, Hemoff, anything you want to ask about this presentation, Dr. Uh, Subramaniam? Anything? Congratulations. Uh, Congratulations. And you, could, you really could show that you shouldn't excise the lateral clavicle because that's what can happen. Then this end, this open end actually will be painful. And this is a big problem. How can you reduce it? How can you prevent the pain when he's doing some crossover um, motion? Then you, you get some, the edge of the clavicle will get some contact. So that's very difficult. So one last question for Professor Ayamov before we sign off from the shoulder session. And what is the current uh, thinking and learning in AC joint dislocations? The most current. From 2020 to 2021. Yeah. Um, we have quite a, a nice level now, but the thing what I don't like is that we still use some fiber tapes. They will stay forever. I would like to have something for, a temporary, for some temporary time, not for all the time. And then we have knots, and knots, they are stay above the clavicle and they, you feel it under the skin. So sometimes you have to take it out. And we are working now on a system that it will, it should be self-locking without the, the use for knots. Um, but the space in the clavicle itself is not big enough to bring it back into the bone joint. But I think this will then be the next step, some self-locking. Um, possibilities instead of just a simple brace where we have to put knots down. Maybe this is asking too much of uh, the AC joint surgery itself um, because the last word is not at told on AC joint surgeries. Um, can we do away using implants at all in AC joint surgeries? Without implants, can we fix AC joint surgeries? That is what I want to ask you, Professor. I think you have done it, Rajkumar, didn't you? For the patient who so, came from... There was a fiber tape which can be considered as an implant. Okay. Well, that is... <laughs> so, you have... Yes, the Professor. Technique you, are use, you are using is nicely and the tendon is, is strong enough, but if you use a brace for the first, let's say, six to ten weeks, it will speed up the rehabilitation process. Otherwise, you have to wait a little bit longer until you can start. It's like the same with, with, AC, with ACL reconstruction or PCL reconstruction. Um, these kind of implants will help us to bring down the, the rehabilitation time. So thank you very much, all the speakers and uh, all the panelists on this shoulder session. Uh, I thank Dr. Malik Arjun, Dr. Raghadatta, and all the uh, First, uh, first 12 members of the OS is gone. Thank you for this opportunity given to us and uh, thank you for uh, being with us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. So we'll go to the second session. Uh, yeah. I think Dr. Prof. Yeah. Yeah. in uh, joining in.
Yes, sir. So we will go with uh, Dr. Sharad Sarao talk. So in this session is on. Uh, so I can stop sharing the screen. Uh, so this session uh, will be on proximal humerus fracture. Prof. Maki has a uh, difficulty in joining. He'll be joining us uh, soon. So this session will be chaired by uh, Dr. Srinivas Kasha from Kim's Hyderabad. And the panelist, uh, Dr. Srinivas Reddy, uh, from uh, uh, is a professor. A professor actually from SV Medical College, uh, Tirupati, and Dr. Uh, Anup from uh, Trivandrum. Dr. Sharad, sir, can you? Sorry, I know it's uh, uh, odd one to uh, brief on your talk. Are you ready? Yeah, yeah, no problem, no problem. Shall I share my screen? Am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay. So my screen is visible. One sec, uh, and uh, one sec, sir. Dr. Anup will just uh, introduce you to the audience. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure. Uh, uh, good evening, everyone, uh, and uh, greetings from uh, Kerala. I'm Dr. Anup here. I would like to thank everybody uh, involved with the uh, OISS and the uh, TraumaCon for giving me this opportunity. Sharad sir was ready to take off with this talk because he absolutely knows that he knows, I mean, he requests no introduction at all to uh, any member of orthopedic fraternity uh, in uh, all of India, let alone OISS. He was one of the uh, doyens of OISS all the time. Professor uh, Sharad Rao is presently the uh, uh, Professor of Orthopedics and Dean of Kasturba Medical College, uh, Manipal. He was the past president of Karnataka Orthopedic Association and of the uh, OISS, that is Orthopedic Association of South Indian States. He was also he is also the past chairman of AO Trauma of India. He has uh, published uh, uh, a lot of uh, papers, more than 85 papers in index journals. He has given invited lectures and orations in all the orthopedic, uh, I mean, all the uh, South Indian states, uh, the member states of OISS. It is my proud privilege, sir, today to welcome you to this um, uh, conference. Uh, you are, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Anu. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. Beautiful. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Dr. Raghu Datta and uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar. This is the second time in the uh, last two years we are having OSIS TraumaCon online. Uh, my lecture is mainly on the insights of proximal humerus fractures through our journey in our institute. If you look at the proximal humerus fractures 30, 25 to 30 years back, uh, most of them would have been treated by conservative management. 15 to 20 years back came the art of fixation for these particular fractures. And most of the fractures are being fixed at that time. Slowly, the other alternatives, looking at the complications we had in fixations, other alternatives like hemi and reverse shoulders came into work. And the pendulum now, especially in the Western countries, has swung towards uh, hemi and reverse shoulders, especially in the elderly. Even today, if you look at proximal humerus fractures, high volume surgeons, those people who do three to four sessions every month, they have a very practical approach for these fractures and invariably the results are good. Proximal humerus fractures are third common fractures apart from distal radius and proximal femoral fractures in the elderly. Unlike proximal femoral fractures where if the first surgery fails, you do a second surgery and the second revision surgery will be almost as good as the first surgery or patient may be normal. But in the shoulder, it is not so. First shot is the best shot. A revision surgery in the shoulder always doesn't give the result of what you expect from your first surgery. What is important is you do what you are comfortable with, with the, what the facilities which are available in your place. What is important to know is the personality of the fracture. Every fracture for that matter has got a personality. When you look at the personality of the fracture, it's the age of the patient. The quality of the bone, you can assess the quality of the bone with the thickness of your uh, cortex or if the facilities are available by BMD. Fracture pattern, which is depicted by CT scans, which are a must if you are going to take up the patient for surgery in proximal humeral fractures. I think uh, CT scan is a must today. And time of surgery, when the patient has presented to you immediately late 
after non-union, all these matters. So fracture pattern or the personality of the fracture is the one which decides the outcome. We have the options available, conservative, open reduction and internal fixation, hemi replacement and reverse shoulders, which are the options for proximal fractures. fractures. Now you weigh between the personality of the fracture and the options available for you. Then you can decide looking at the age, bone quality, fracture pattern and time of surgery, whether you are going to do conservative, open reduction internal fixation, hemi replacement or a reverse shoulder. Broadly, the guidelines are conservative in un or minimally displaced fracture and we are still in a dilemma what is minimally displaced. Open reduction and internal fixation definitely in young or, or old with a viable head and good bone quality. Hemi replacement in an old patient, non-viable head, good or poor bone quality where the cuff is intact. And reverse shoulder, old, non-viable head, poor bone quality and cuff not intact. So this is the broad guidelines which you can adopt to treat these fractures. What is non-operative when it is minimally displaced? When it is displaced, when there is a low functional demand from the patient, poor medical conditions, and the, there is less pain from the shoulder because of many other reasons which the patient has got because of the comorbidities. One of the examples where you can see that the head is below the greater fibrosity, and because of the comorbidities and the age, the patient has got not fit for surgery, so underwent conservative management. And that is the end result. What does the end result show? It shows that the head of the humerus is in varus, likely to have restriction of external rotation and abduction. And the patient is happy as long as there is no pain. Another case where you have this patient had, she was 92 year old, comorbid, depending on others for her daily routine activities, had a pacemaker and had this fracture underwent conservative management with a brace for the distal fracture and a sling for the upper fracture. And this is the outcome. And the patient is happy with it because she doesn't have any pain with the limited shoulder movement which can, she can accommodate. Fractures like this, where you have the greater stuart uh, tuberosity with lower level when compared to the level of the head, which is good for the rotator cuff function. You can see that there is downward displacement of the fracture. This is mainly because of the atonia of the deltoid that happens. And finally, the union has occurred and the patient is happier. 52 years old, road traffic accident, smoker, alcoholic, young patient with a good bone quality, you can see that the head is dislocated, the tuberosities are not aligned. This is a CT scan. Whenever we operate on a patient with proximal humeral fracture, CT scan is a must because it makes your life comfortable when you go in. You can plan your surgeries, you can keep a backup if there is something wrong happens on the table. What is important to understand is it's a soft tissue surgery. Soft tissue handling is important and Dr. Mackey will discuss about the management of tuberosities, which I will not go into much details in this. Suture, sutures put to the greater and lesser tuberosities to hold them and treat them like a soft tissue and then attaching them in a proper position is the key for the success, whether you are fixing it or doing a hemi replacement for these fractures. Shows and you have to use many techniques, K-wires, chance rules to get the position, especially the valgus position in the head. We don't only look at the AP plane. We also have to look at the horizontal plane, how much the retroversion or the antiversion the fracture has got. And that is, more, that is also as important as the AP view of the X-ray and get all of them in position and then fix them in in this and you get a good result. Big nets are young patient, good bone quality, restore function and preserve head is the key. A 40 year old, good quality bone, but the fracture is quite bad. What do you expect as an outcome? Here, 
small fragment of the head, unlikely to be vascular, but the patient is younger, with the tuberosity is shattered, underwent a fixation. As you expect, this happened because of the vascularity of the head, there was a collapse and the screws penetrated into the joint and it was painful for the patient. So because of the pain, the implant was removed. And before the sutures were removed for this implanting, patient came back. So unless you are doing a definitive procedure in the proximal humerus, we advise that you only remove the screws which are producing problems rather than doing, trying to remove the entire implant because this will always produce, because of the thickness of the screw, the chances of having fracture later is quite high. And then he underwent fixation for that fracture. Not a happy patient after that, not a good outcome. 40-year-old man, right-handed, fell on outstretched hand, no neurovascular deficit. If you look closely at the X-ray, there is likely chance of dislocation, especially the posterior dislocation. That is what exactly the axillary view of the X-ray showed. So went anteriorly to fix this fracture, approached the fracture, had to do osteotomy of the greater tuberosity to get into the fragment from the anterior approach, got it into position, fixed with the plate, and that's the outcome. And it shows that the fragment is not sitting very well posteriorly because it's very difficult to see the posterior part when you approach this from the anterior aspect. And that's eight months later, and that's 10 months later, and 14 months later, the patient is doing well. 75 year old male, right handed, fell in bathroom. No neurovascular deficit, has a lot of comorbidities. This is the CT scan. Appears to be a non viable head, osteoporotic bone, underwent hemi replacement. In hemi replacement, it is very important that you get your tuberosities back, otherwise, the results of hemi replacement will be worse than the fractures fixation. Another example where both the tuberosities are shattered. The head is dislocated, small piece of the head, again underwent hemi replacement. The tuberosity doesn't look good, especially in the greater tuberosity. And in the follow-up, you can see what has happened. The tuberosity, greater tuberosity has given away. This process has migrated up and definitely it's not going to give good results as far as the patient is concerned. 81-year-old female, untreated, complaints of pain, this is the situation, bone quality is not very good, underwent MA replacement, anatomical replacement, and the patient is happy after that, pain is elevated, and movement is as much as what she had before, because before she had the movement at the fracture site, now it's occurring in the joint, that's the only difference. Treat them as different injuries. Young patients restore function, preserve the head. Elderly patients look at elevating the pain and restore function as much as possible by the methods which you are familiar with. Broadly, indications for hemi are low functional demand, poor bone quality, advanced age, vascularity of the head is compromised, and when patient is likely to undergo one surgery in lifetime. There are problems with the hemi. Tuberosity is the main thing which has to be addressed when you do a hemi. Prosthetic malposition, functional limitations, usually above the 90 degrees is less likely to get in the patient and rehabilitation is very important in these patients. You can also use suture anchors to hold your tuberosity is in position, in addition to the sutures which you take around 
the bone and the musculotendinous junction. This is an important slide where you look at the fracture personality, look at the age, bone quality, fracture pattern, and time of surgery. Look at the patient pearls, whether there are medical comorbidities. What's the functional recovery? Usually a functional recovery in a shoulder surgery, especially in a proximal humeral fracture, takes 12 to 18 months. Even though there is a fracture, there is a soft tissue injury, there is also an additional injury to the nerves, which may not be very evident, especially suprascapular nerve and the axillary nerve, which will take some time for it to heal. And a good functional recovery you can expect only after 12 to 18 months. CT scan and 3D reconstruction are very important in decision making, especially when you are doing a fixation. Delay in surgeries, whether non-union has occurred, a partly union has occurred, are also important to decide on the type of fixation or type of treatment. Algorithm questions you can ask is operative and non-operative. Head preserving or head replacement. When you do an ORIF, it is important that not only in the vertical plane, in the horizontal plane also you have to look at. An excessive retroversion will produce limitation of internal rotation so that he won't be able to reach his back pocket, even, even though he might be able to reach other's back pocket. And too much of antiversion will reduce the external rotation and in turn will reduce the abduction. So it is important not only in the vertical plane looking at varus valgus, but also in the horizontal plane, especially when you do an open reduction and internal fixation and hemi and reverse. So these four points, if you keep in mind, overlap these four points in fracture personality, patient pearls and algorithm questions, and then you get a treatment method for all these fractures. What are the problems in proximal humerus fractures? The classification, knees classification, AVOS classification. So there are many classifications which have been described. What is important to know is the understanding the pattern of the fracture by CT scan and 3D reconstruction. Hertel's criteria that about the vascularity of the head is still controversial. Four years later, after Hertel described his criteria in 2004, Bastian came out with a paper which tells you that the vascularity of the head is not dependent on a vascular necrosis or the fracture collapse. So in a young patient, even though the head appears vas a vascular by Hertel's criteria, you can go ahead and fix it. RCTs are very confusing as far as the proximal uh, humeral fractures are concerned because these are the ones which usually mislead and especially when you go into each aspect of an RCT, then you will understand that there is some flaw in comparing two groups. Geographical variation, if you look at North America, this pendulum is swinging more towards hemi and reverse shoulder in an elderly patient, and more towards fixation in uh, European countries, whereas in India, it still has geographical variation depending upon the surgeon's capability and also depending upon what are the facilities available in your setup. This one, greater tuberosity fracture with anterior dislocation, old, unreduced, came back, came after eight months in an 81-year-old lady. And this is the CT scan. And she underwent, because of the cuff problem, she underwent reverse shoulder, and this is her moment after six months. And the patient is quite happy to get 90 degrees of moment, which she never had before she underwent the surgery. In summary, fracture in young need fixation. Fixation is a soft tissue procedure with bony alignment. Elderly osteoporotic comminuted fracture needs hemi if the cuff is intact. Reverse shoulder when indicated, especially there is cuff problems or you expect that the tuberosity is not going to heal. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, thank you, sir. Dr. Srivas Kasha, can now. Thank you, sir. That was a wonderful talk. So do we have Dr. Michael Mackey? Yeah, he's, uh, he's almost, yeah, so he had called me from difficulty joining in, 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 in uh, Isolia. Yeah. 
is there hello everyone yeah hello oh, yeah on time i'm i'm terribly sorry i'm having trouble with the uh the zoom package was not up to date so i had to download and install a new zoom anyways i should be good to go yeah actually we finished the second talk prof or we'll be going back to your talk uh you can go with your uh, prof malumurus lecture talk uh, all right let me get that loaded up here a second So while we are waiting for him to get his thing, uh, I'll just give a short introduction. Uh, Dr. McKee is truly a, a <clears throat> joined in orthopedics. He has almost 30 years of experience in orthopedics. He obtained his MD and uh, his orthopedic training from uh, the University of Toronto and then completed a fellowship in orthopedic traumatology at the MGH under the <clears throat> legendary Jesse Jupiter. He's a recipient of many awards to name a few the Edwin G. Uh, Bovell Award uh, multiple times, then the uh, Near Award from the American Shoulder and Elbow Surgeons, the Robert Salter Award for Teaching Excellence, several uh, awards for uh, teaching excellence. He has published not only several uh, papers, but also uh, multiple high-impact uh, randomized control trials over the years. In 2017, he accepted position as the Professor and Chair of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, Phoenix. He was the president of the Orthopedic Trauma Association in 2020. He's a reviewer of uh, numerous uh, peer review journals and the editor of uh, Journal of Orthopedic Trauma and elite reviewer of Journal of uh, Bone and Joint Surgery. It's a privilege to have you today, sir. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. I apologize for being a bit late. So let me just try and get on here and share my screen. Uh, here we go. Now, can you see that okay? Yeah, we can see your screen. Good. Screen's good, okay. So I'm gonna speak about proximal humeral fracture this morning uh, based on tuberosity fixation, which is a bit of a different type of fixation we've seen recently. And I'd like to very much thank the organizers of this meeting for the opportunity to speak. Uh, it's a real privilege and honor and uh, we'll do our best to have some fun and, and learn a few things here this morning. So if we look at modern randomized uh, control trials, looking at operative versus non-operative fixation of older patients with proximal humeral fractures, we see that rather disappointingly, there's not a lot of difference between the two groups. These three studies, including the PROFER study, which was a fairly uh, high profile um, randomized trial, showed that there really was not much difference in the outcome scores between these various groups, between the surgical and the non-surgical groups. Well, why is that? Well, we know that there are a lot of successes with proximal humeral place, but we also know that there are a lot of failures as well. So we have loss fixation, we have tuberosity pull off, we have uh, screws pulling out, backing out, et cetera. So if you look at those studies, the group that had surgery, that had fractures heal in a good position are the best patients in those studies, but we can't do that reliably. The complication rate remains high, with surgical fixation and those numbers bring the overall average down in the surgical group. Well, how do we improve upon that? Because even in 2021, this is still an issue. When I was at the American Academy, and this is the last time we had a live meeting, I asked the audience, you know, what issues do you have with the proximal humeral plate that you currently use? And you can see that tuberosity fixation and screw penetration in the joint were two of the biggest problems that people had, especially tuberosity fixation where you can lose the GT or the head spins off into varus. And that was a significant concern for a lot of people uh, in this kind of setting. This is a case of mine where you can see uh, we have a nice fixation of the tuberosity, everything looks good. The plate's a bit higher than usual because there was a large DT piece. And I usually often put uh, locking sutures through the rotator cuff and onto the plate as well. And we did that in this case as well. But despite all those efforts, you can see the tuberosity is pulled off. In an older patient, this usually means conversion to a reverse arthroplasty. In a younger patient, it's a major disaster. It's very difficult to salvage this type of situation because of the difficulty in getting the tuberosity back down and getting the cuff reattached uh, to it in this kind of setting. So this remains a problem in my hands and a lot of people's hands with this kind of fixation. This is a picture from Gilles Walsh, who's a famous uh, French 
uh, shoulder surgeon who's really written a book on a lot of uh, electives uh, and uh, rotator cuff procedures and uh, shoulder surgery. He's showing here that with the standard humeral locking plate, there's really no good fixation of the tuberosities, either at the back with the greater uh, tuberosity or in the front with the lesser. The plate's on the side, the tuberosities are in the front and the back, and that's a uh, very difficult fixation in this kind of setting. And we all suture the greater tuberosity back down. We've been taught to do that. I do that as well. The problem is, is that if you look at it biomechanically, those tension relieving sutures, the ability to put the cuff back really doesn't seem to improve the stability of a three or four part proximal humeral fracture. And there's really very little mechanical data that says, yes, this is a good thing to do. So we all do it, but really, unfortunately, it doesn't make much of a difference to uh, the overall strength of the construct. And here's a recent paper out from a group in Germany, which is a well a well um, uh, designed study looking at over almost 100 patients. And they found that tuberosity pull off was a significant issue and that a lot of these patients had problems. The complication rate in this modern series from a good group was 37% and 27% required, required revision surgery. This is a rate much higher than what we'd anticipate in other areas. And they said that if your GT pulled off, that happened one time in four, and the relative risk for poor outcome increased threefold. So it really is a bad, bad issue when this happens. Back in the days when I used to use a small clover leaf plate, I used to take a plate and contour it around the two brassies, almost like a hook plate. And this, of course, can potentially produce impingement, but I think we'd all rather have the picture on the right where the two brassies back down where it belongs and held there securely than the picture on the left where you know this is going to be a very bad outcome for this patient on the left-hand side. With all those thoughts in mind, we designed a plate, and, and I do have a financial interest in this plate, but we have full disclosure, and my financial disclosures are on the American Academy website. We designed a plate that has a hook on top and has flanges to control or corral the tuberosities to hold them in place better. It's just like a proximal humor plate. It has all the advantages of that, locking screws, calcar position screws, et cetera, but it also has a combination of flanges and you can choose the combination that you'd like to use to hold the tuberosities in place better and rely more on tuberosity fixation from the flanges rather than just pure screw fixation. And these plates will be contoured in situ once you have them applied to make things better. We did a biomechanical study looking specifically at how well the greater tuberosity is held by these plates. And you can see here, this is a pictorial of our mechanical study. On the left-hand side is the hook plate that ITS produces. In the middle is the standard plate, and then you can see x-rays on the side. You can see the obvious mechanical advantage here, theoretically, from the hook holding the tuberosity. This is our experimental model here. And these are our findings. You can see that the ITS hook plate had clear superiority overall, almost two and a half times more stability, if you want to look at it in that way, compared to the regular plate for holding the two porosity down. So there's a really dramatic biomechanical advantage in holding this plate, this plate in place and holding the two porosity down in this kind of setting. This is a, an example of a relatively simple, and I'll show you some clinical examples now. This is a, a, a clinical a picture of um, a patient with a relatively simple fracture. Uh, it's not really that displaced. And you can see it's off the back like usual. This is a, a, an op the operation we did. You can actually use the flanges to compress the head together. So you're more reliant on the position of the plate and the flanges than pure screw fixation in order to get fixation in this kind of uh, picture. And you can use that superior hook if you use it for better fixation, you can really compress that down. When you put that screw in, it holds things down nicely. This is another example of a 58-year-old female with an impacted valgus fracture, a large greater tuberosity fragment. You can see that would be a major problem in terms of fixation and holding that, fi uh, that fixed. And you can hear, I see how the hook actually digs right into the tuberosity and the front and back flanges hold the tuberosity in place. You can also see that we've also uh, been very careful to adhere to the other basic principles in this situation. We put a screw in the calcar, that's very critical. We get a good reduction. We don't leave it any residual varus. In addition to all those standard things that you do with hook plate, we do that here. But also you can see how the front and the back flanges can hold the humor head in place. So you don't get translational problems like you do 
with a standard place where you can malrotate or maltranslate the head. This, that lady, eight weeks with good healing and 120 degrees of flexion. I'm going to show you a case, and people always ask me about impingement. What about impingement? That is a bit of a concern. This is a patient who had a severe fractious location of the shoulder. You can see there's a large GT fragment there, and that's a major concern as well. This is the fixation of that patient with the hook driven right into the GT fragment. This is the patient healing, subsequent uh, healing down the road once the axillary nerve palsy recovered. And you can see here, this patient has full rotation. There's no impingement of the flange of the plate. And that's a major concern in the past where you can see that the flanges make impingement on the articular surface. But if you leave the flanges just shy of the margin of the articular surface, then you get full rotation without impingement uh, with these plates applied. So to conclude, I'll say that most patients, especially the elderly can and should be treated non-operative. We all know that. Currently, three modern randomized trials in general do not show significant improvement with fixation compared to non-operative treatment with the standard place that we have. In the series I showed from Germany, from a good solid group using modern techniques in 2021, showed a 27% reoperation rate. We still have significant issues in fixing these fractures with the implants that we do have. If you do choose to fix them, there are several established principles that are important to maximize success. Make sure you get a good reduction. Make sure that you use a calcar screw. But we think this newer plate that we've designed also has some significant advantages for fixation when it's based on the two porosities. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Ramaki. Uh, that was a wonderful, wonderful talk. Uh, I just have one question. So sure. what are the chances of impingement? So we, we don't we don't think the plate impinges at, at the front or the back very much. So you can the, the flanges at the front of the back are well shy of the articular margins. So that's not an issue. There is the potential for impingement superiorly, and, and I agree with you there. So far, um, when we put the plate on and you really make sure that the uh, flanges are driven down into the bone, the rate of impingement is very low. And so we have only removed uh, one or two of these plates out of the first 60 that we put in. Um, and I'd much rather have uh, the situation where the two porosities healed in place and there's a bit of impingement rather than having a two porosity pull off. If the plate impinges, you can come back and take it off as long as things are healed. It's an easy solution. If the two porosity pulls off, um, then it's a major disaster for the patient. So we have removed the plate for impingement, I think once, maybe twice out of 60 patients so far. Thank you. Any any questions? So, Professor, what are your indications for this plate um, over a regular proximal humerus plate? When would you uh, rather use uh, uh, this uh, clover plate? I mean, hook plate. Well, I've, we have different um, different models, so that I use this plate for most fractures now. Um, the full bore plate with all of the flanges and the hook on top, I use for four part fractures in people where I'm trying to fix the, the fracture and not replace it. So a 50, 60 year old four part fracture, um, those are the, the primary indications of the plate. If we have a younger patient with better bone quality, a two part fracture, then probably a, a standard plate's reasonable. But for the older patient with the three and four part fractures, this has become our standard plate for fixing these, these fractures. And it's basically eliminated GT pull off. We have complications like everyone else, but pull off of the two brassies is not one that we see anymore with this plate. It's very encouraging that way. I have a question, Mr. Uh, Jr. This question is for all the panelists. Uh, do you consider primary decompression of the acromia when you use the plate, proximal humerus fracture? Any experience on that? My question is that, any primary decompression of the acromia is useful when you're suspecting impingement. Any experience on that? Um, personally, um, if there's a very prominent acromion, or especially if I'm doing a deltoid split approach, so I do the deltoid split approach on occasion. And in those situations, I have you, and you can use this plate through a deltoid split, by the way. If you find the acromion is very prominent in that kind of setting, then yes, I have used. Um, a, 
primary uh, uh, chromial plastic with a microsatural saw to help decompress that space. I have done that. Not so much the delta pectoral, it's more difficult to do, but I have done that. Professor Messi, uh, what about biceps tendon when you use this plate to hold the lesser tuberosity? So most of the time, and anyone over about 50 years old now, I'm going to take the bicep tendon when I do the operation. So I do a tenodesis pretty well every time uh, in someone over 50 now. The biceps just seems to be um, a pain generator. It's not that important, um, et cetera, et cetera. So in general, um, I take the biceps tendon older patients now. If you want to leave it, and once you reconstruct the fracture, the, the biceps will run in a groove um, underneath the front flange of the plate. And so the plate goes over top and the biceps will run underneath that flange without too much impingement. And I've got a video of that um, uh, in, the, in one of my cases so that if you do reconstruct the proximal immersion and you want to leave the biceps alone, you can do that and nothing bad seems to happen. It, it's quite uh, acceptable. So you don't have to take it every time. H how about yourself? Do you routinely take it or leave it in older patients? Older patients, I keep it. I don't uh, take it out unless it's uh, damaged. Second question is, uh, is it these are the alternatives or you go with the same type of suturing techniques and this is an addition to the suturing technique in the proximal human fracture? So I still use the suturing technique most of the time and this is addition to it. And that's the way our experimental biomechanical setup was, was made. But I'm not sure it adds much, frankly. If there's a hole or a rent in the rotator cuff, of course I repair that. So I have a nice, good sleeve on top and then put the, put the hook in the tuberosity um, and I put the sutures to the, to the plate. But I'm, I'm beginning to think now that it's not that big uh, an important difference in that I'm, I'm, I lately I've been doing it less and less and I don't think it makes any difference biomechanically. And that's what our study would show. So you should have the confidence to believe in your biomechanics sometimes. And I think... It's nice to do it, but I don't think it adds much. If the if the cuff or the two bras are multiple fragments, by all means, make them one so you can put the hook in it. But for an isolated GT fracture with no big cuff tear, I don't think it's necessary anymore to do that, frankly. Just waste time. Professor Mackey, I know that you are uh, more towards uh, hemi and reverse as far as older patients are concerned in proximal humerus fracture. Does this plate has changed your views in uh, older patients? So that's an excellent, excellent question. And so I, the answer is yes. I feel more confident now fixing uh, more difficult fractures in an active 65-year-old. So if you have a 65-year-old who plays tennis or who plays cricket, <laughs> and you, which I, I still don't understand how, how you score in cricket, but we'll leave that for now. Or you, you, they're a sport or athlete, or they like to work in their car, and all, all, et cetera. It's a very, um, in North America, that person, if they're healthy, they might live another 30 years until they're 90 or 95. A, a reverse is not going to last that long. Yes. And so in that very active individual in their 60s, um, this plate gives me more confidence fixing that tough fracture that I don't want to do a reverse on for that specific reason. If they're 80 and they've got diabetes and heart disease, and a terrible fracture dislocation, yeah, reverse for sure. But that gray zone area where you know you know the reverse is going to be good for five or 10 years, but you know down the road they're going to pay the price, especially if they're very active. Um, then this, is, this has changed my practice for that specific group. That, that's an excellent point. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Professor, uh, may I ask you a question, Dr. Rajkumar here? Yes. This question is for both Dr. Sharath and uh, Professor Mackey. Um, I see in some instances uh, your proximal liver fixations will uh, be not giving optimum outcome. And sometimes you have seen that your screws will go into the joint and there will be a collapse of the head itself. So do you routinely uh, suggest that we should use a biological uh, graft or biological uh, augment to you know, supplement your fixation that you're talking about, whether, whichever plate you want to use, whether it is a fibular graft or ilac crest graft, do you suggest that we should routinely use or it has to be used in a particular case only. Dr. Sharath, did you want to address that? Yeah. <clears throat> I don't have much experience with the fibular strut uh, graft, especially we have used in few cases the fibular strut graft on the uh, inside, especially when the patient is younger and the proximal fragment is quite small and you need a strut to hold it so that it won't go get into various position. The second important point is uh, uh, 
uh, avascularity and collapse do not go together along with your Hartel's classification of vascularity. Most of the predicted avascular fragments may not undergo avascularity and collapse in when you see them over a period of time. So what you need is a good calcar screw to hold it in position. A greater tuberosity position is very important. Once the greater tuberosity slips off, then everything goes haywire. You get virus, you get penetration of the screws, and you get a collapse along with that. I agree, com I agree completely. So number one is I don't use the fibular strut graphs for fracture cases. I think the, the information now that's available, including a couple of papers recently showed in general, it doesn't make that big a difference to outcome. I do use it for non-unions though. So if there's a clear cut surgical neck non-union and the head's one piece, I do use it for non-unions. I found it very effective there, but not for fresh fractures anymore. Secondly, as Dr. Sharath points out, if you can keep the head in the right position, a lot of these, this cascade of bad things doesn't happen. And I agree completely with that. And to avoid those things, the, the, the plate we use helps cradle the, the head together. So you don't rely so much on those screws. So the superior screws, which are often the ones that penetrate, I leave those a bit short. Make sure you have a calcar screw. Make sure you have no varus. And make sure that you don't let that varus collapse occur by holding the GT down. If you do those things, our rate of screw head penetration has been very low. In fact, I don't think we've had a single case with that issue. And that's a major issue in other series. So you can reduce that rate of screw penetration by doing the standard things, which is good reduction, no varus, um, calcar screw or screws, and make sure that you don't uh, let the GT pull off. I, I think there's probably a role for, you know, calcium phosphate cements or, or more sliced allograft in some of these cases where there's a big hole or defect. Just there's no compelling evidence at the present time in a good prospective study that makes a difference at, at this time. Michael, one of my colleagues wanted to ask a question that uh, how easy to put this plate from the dentopectoral approach or you specifically use dentoid splitting approach? I, my standard approach is the deltopectoral approach. I, I've, I've toyed with both and especially if there's pathology around the back, the big GT pieces pulled around the back, the deltoid split can help you. There's a good randomized trial um, from the doctors in Montreal, Canada. It's in the JSES uh, within the last year or two, looking at deltoid split versus a deltopectoral. And they were strong proponents of the deltoid split. And what they found was that the deltopectoral approach actually gave a better functional outcome and a, low, a better reduction and a lower complication rate. So for me, that has changed my practice. I've gone back to using mostly deltopectoral. I do have slides I didn't show for the sake of time that you can also use this through a, delto, a deltoid split approach if you wish. That's not a big deal. It's the same principles. It's a little tighter getting the plate in for sure. And I wouldn't maybe do it the first time I use the plate, um, but you can do it through a deltoid split as well. But generally speaking, deltopectoral for me. Mackie, uh, generally the greater tuberosity that escapes is so those are the comminuted ones, not the big chunk ones. Do you, by the, your plate, do you hold it specifically or? I look, I try and I try and suture everything together. So I have one piece with the cuff. So I've got a sleeve of tissue with other two brassy fragments there. And then basically um, I pick the one biggest piece and put it down there. In the cases we've done, that has been successful every time, except for one case. In one case, I kept half the two brassy down and the other half pulled around the back. That patient has not got as great a result um, as, as the other patients, but it's not a disaster. So we kept the main piece there, but some of that posterior sleeve pulled around. So he's got weakness and impingement in external rotation, but he can still flex well. And so it's not ideal, but it's better than having the whole sleeve of tissue pull off. So that does happen. Um, it's happened to us once and uh, it did affect the result, but not, it wasn't a complete disaster, which is what happens when the whole tuberosity pulls off. So it's a good, very good question. Uh, Professor Sherab, this is another question to you from the audience. Uh, do you have any uh, age cutoff uh, for doing a hemiarthroplasty? Because a hemi is going to be entirely almost depend on the function of the, I mean, the union of the uh, tuberosity. So even if you have a intact uh, cuff, do you uh, uh, sometimes uh, prefer to do a, a reverse shoulder rather than a hemi? 
yeah, that's a difficult question too. We can in our setup we can't have a reverse shoulder as a backup. We can only have a hemi as our backup. So it's only between the fixation or the hemi. So hemi it is very important to analyze the tuberosities because they are the ones which are which determine the outcome of the hemi. Apart from uh, comminuted, yes, there is many methods which have been described depending upon the processes you use, the ways to fix them with the sutures and uh, hope for the best. That is the tuberosity. And apart from that, maintaining the tuberosity is in position. And the second thing is having a good version. These are the two important factors for the success of hemi replacement and choose your patient. Most important is choose your patients with comorbidities, not high demand on the shoulders, and uh, not good quality of bone. These are the patients who will do well when you select them from here. How do you plan for the height of the uh, process? Depending upon the position on the table, you see it so that you see the movement, whether it is subluxating in, the, in that position, push and pull, and see to it that you get the original. Dr. Shivas, can I ask you your uh, case so that can I have more? Yeah, sure. Sir, Mikey, yeah. I just add, I, I agree with that completely. One thing I might add is it's, it's become very popular in North America now to use a platform stem. So we could argue hemi versus a reverse all day long. But one thing that's become very and critically important is to use a platform stem. So if you do a hemi and it doesn't work, um, then you can convert it to a reverse without having to dig the stem out. And that's made a big difference uh, going forward. I'd like to welcome our uh, panelists, uh, Dr. Srinivas Reddy, Dr. Anup, and I'd like to request Dr. Sarath Rao and uh, Professor Mekki to be uh, online. Just will I'll present few cases. This is a 35 year old male uh, fell from a two wheeler uh, road traffic accident in severe pain and not able to use the limb. Uh, sir, uh, Sharath Rao, sir, how do you go about it? Take an axillary view, scapular Y view, and a CT scan. Yeah. So, all the time, uh, how to, uh, when we have a severely painful limb, how to get a proper. Uh, so, if you are sure view. that you, if you are sure that you are going to get a CT scan, I don't think you need uh, other two X-rays if it is pain. So, but in the periphery where you don't have CT scan available, how do you, you know, what, what is your suggestion? Just for the discussion sake. <laughs> you could get a well view. It would well not be very painful. Yeah. That's yeah. great. I think, I think uh, that's not that painful. And at the same time, we get some information. So, that is the CT scan here, sir. Uh, I'd like to play the... You, you can get a hint on the AP film that something's not right that with the head that looks like it's out the back on the on the plane film there. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Professor Mickey, please. No, I'm just saying even on the on the uh, plane film, you can see something doesn't look quite right with the head, so it's not surprising to see it's out the back and. So they have a posterior fracture dislocation of, of the shoulder. It looks like there's a fairly significant uh, impaction That's fragment uh, on that. And the LT looks like it's broken as well. So this patient will probably need an open reduction to have this put back in. And I think the key thing on the approach here is to, is to, is to not take off the subscapularis, but to use the LT and leave the uh, subscap attached to it as a separate piece in your approach, and you can plug it in the hole when you fix the fracture on the, on the way out. So I would, uh, the, the, I would use a delta pectoral approach to fix this and make sure that I maintain the subscap attached to that lesser tuberosity fragment. I think you can see on the CT scan there. Great. Great. So, uh, Dr. Sharatra, sir, uh, yep. so any, anything to add? No, only delta pectoral view, uh, delta pectoral approach, and uh, greater tuberosity is anyway fractured. Lesser tuberosity is likely to be fractured. Use the suture anchors, open them, and you can see the raw fracture surface in front of you. Use a small chance to, to put into the head and get it back into the position. Okay. It's quite easy. 
Dr. Srinivas? There is no spike, no metaphyseal <laughs> spike. Sometimes they have a metaphyseal spike where it becomes a little bit difficult to get them from deltopectal, deltopectal approach. Yeah. So, Dr. Srinivas Reddy, sir, and Dr. Anup, anything to add? Uh, yeah, let me just, yeah. We have discussed both the things. And uh, that was Delta uh, exactly. here. Yeah, you can use that. Yes. Yes, I had to use a shanch pin to get get it reduced, and then I've used sutures uh, across the tuberosities. And as you said, so I had to fix uh, lesser tuberosity with a screw. So, any comments on this, sir? The, the the shoulder wants to redislocate if when it internally rotates into that defect that's usually in the front, the reverse right. hillsides. And so I think in these, you have two choices with the lesser tuberosity. You can put it back anatomically if you want, or if there's a big defect there, you can actually medialize it a bit and put it in that defect. So it's not anatomic, but it fills that defect so that when they internally rotate, they don't dislocate back into that hole. So if you have the LT and the subscap attached to it, it gives you that flexibility to use it for that defect if, if you need to. And that's a very good technique. Looks great. So uh, that's his follow-up after around six months. So I'll just, uh, so how common is, you know, how commonly uh, the posterior dislocation is missed? I just want to ask full, uh, the house. Am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Yes, yes, yes. yes. How commonly the posterior dislocation yes. is missed in your practice? So it is by well, X-ray before getting yes. CT scan. Yes. yes, it still happens. So I've I've seen three patients in the last year with a missed posterior dislocation. So it happens much less now that that here, anyways, everyone seems to get a CT scan right off the bat. So it's, it's much less common to have it missed, but it still happens. And I've seen the three patients I can think of in the last year or two with that. Usually, and when I say missed, I mean, they're alcoholics who have a seizure and they don't come in right away and, and they're unreliable patients. And they have a CT scan scheduled, but they don't go for it, you know, that kind of thing. So it, it is still a common uh, misdiagnosis here in uh, North America, but it's not as high as that. <laughs> If you have a post-seizure fracture, I think it's most of the time uh, post-seizure fracture dislocation is a posterior dislocation. Consider it is posterior. Yeah. So if you have time, I have got a couple of cases. I just yeah, you can show one more case. Sir. One more case. Yeah. yeah. So here is a 55-year-old male uh, uh, fell down in uh, in bathroom and sustained this. So this is a nasty fracture and, and it, it's a kind of valgus impacted so that the head is squashed down and spit the two brosses out. So a 55 year old male, uh, I think this really demands surgery. There's, there's no other way around it. If you leave this alone, it's gonna be a disastrous result, demand surgery. And this is, this is an ideal case for the, for the Phoenix plate where you can hold the two, you can prop the head back up, bring the two brosses back down underneath and then hold the whole thing together uh, with the plate, especially the two brosity piece, piece or fragment, which is going to be the hard part. Yeah. Uh, I so have the a question. The neurovascular status, the, neuro uh, the, the medial spike seems to be too far out and medial. Yeah, so. yeah it's intact. Neurovascular it's intact. Yeah. I have a question, uh, Professor Mackey. So, uh, which one do you uh, think is more stable? Uh, whether to put a screw through that uh, greater tuberosity with Phoenix plate? Are your suture through the tuberosities? I think the screw through the plate is probably the more uh, favorable and the stronger fixation, frankly, with the hook holding the plate to, and holding that piece down. And if you look at it biomechanically, it's pretty clear that's much better than the suture technique we've used in the past. Two and, two and a half times stronger, 500 newtons compared to 220 newtons in terms of strength and, and resisting displacement. Uh, Dr. Sherat, sir, anything to add? Uh, no, because whenever you take the sutures from the tuberosities, take uh, two sutures, not one. 
okay one uh, if very close to the muscle flow the tendinous and bony junction other one if possible through the bone with a, a cutting needle so never ever go with the one single suture great we usually use ethy bond and we use two ethy bond for each of us yes and it's quite easy to pull uh, with one one suture and then you can take a bite from the junction yes exactly so uh, osteosynthesis or arthroplasty sir 55 years borderline marriage bone quality is very good okay and look at the bone quality even my this uh, age may be just chronological age it may not be physiological age so also look at what age you are looking at and the bone quality is quite, quite good and even uh, the head appears to be vascular mm -hmm. have fixes yes There, there are a few randomized trials out now, including one from Norway, looking at older patients with this type of fracture fixation versus arthroplasty. And the patients with reverse arthroplasty did significantly better at a lower complication rate. The problem is a, is a healthy 55-year-old, that person may live another 35 or 40 years, and I doubt an arthroplasty is going to last that long. So it's short-term success, but probably long-term they have an issue. So. If at all possible, I would rather fix this fracture and if the patient's healthy than than do an arthroplasty. Okay. Dr. Anu, Anu, anything to add? Yeah, I, I, I think we'll also uh, plan for a, a, a process in the deposit. Uh, come again, I didn't get that. Also, at this age, we'll have to give the biology a trial. Oh, great. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Fix it. So uh, th this was fixed through delta head splitting approach and, uh, you know, held with uh, suture, sutures through the tuberosities and that's been fixed to the, and that's the outcome after an year, the same patient. That's great. Dr. Srinivas, you do all your, all your uh, uh, proximal humerus through the delta head splitting approach or? Yeah. Mo most, most of them there's delta head splitting. Except that, that is, uh, except that his hair is gray. Otherwise, he is a young 55 year. Yeah. Your patient. Sir, sir, your preferred uh, approach and position of the patient for a proximal humerus, including a, a GT fracture and a Professor McKay. I always do delta pectoral approach. So the, my only so, indication for delta splitting is an isolated greater tuberosity fracture with uh, un, undisplaced uh, neck. Is the only indication. Position of the patient, be chair supine? Supine. I will be comfortable with supine. I adjust, the, I adjust the x ray for both AP and lateral view before we start so that there's an easy access for the image intensifier. It's also important that you always have a look at the lateral view rather than turning your arm and get your image intensifier into the lateral. I, I usually sit the patient up about 45 degrees just because it, it makes it easier for me. I don't like bending over so much, um, but it's more just for surgery, surgeon convenience. So a semi-sitting position with a radiolucent uh, top to the table. I use delta petrol for most of these approaches. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, sorry, sir, sorry to interrupt. Uh, we're out of time. Can we move to the next session? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all the Thank panelists you. and speakers. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Srinivas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Srinivas. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Nice Thank you. to be here. Thank you very much. Third session Thanks, is everyone. On, uh, uh, elbow trauma. Uh, this will be chaired by Dr. Uh, v. Singar Vadivelu. He's a professor from uh, Madras Medical College. And the panelists are Dr. Amarnath and Dr. Uh, Sibin Surendran. So, again, the first talk will be by uh, Prof. McKee on intraarticular uh, fractures of distal humerus how to maximize success. So Professor, can you please share your screen and uh, proceed with the talk? Okay, I'll do that. And then I'm going to go here. You, can, can you see that? Not yet, not yet. Not yet. Okay, I'm gonna share. Yeah, how about that? Is that working? Yeah. Okay, great. So I'm going to take the next 10 or 15 minutes or so and talk about uh, distal humeral uh, fractures, uh, how to maximize uh, success. And um, uh, the first session was fantastic. I, I learned a lot and some great cases, and hopefully this will be the same.
just make sure I can advance here. There we go. So I'm going to try and make a few points here. And this is going to be a point-based talk as opposed to the previous one. Now, number one, if the fracture is open 90% of the time that the wound is posterior or posterior lateral, and there'll be a big hole in the triceps that you can use to incorporate into your approach. And I'll show you an example of that. This is a patient who uh, fell off a roof and you can see that they have a relatively simple um, intraarticular fracture pattern, but that there's also some air, et cetera, in the soft tissues. And you can see this large posterior spike right there that has obviously come out through the skin and created the open wound that I'll show you in a second. And when you see that, you know that if the triceps is, if the hole is in the skin is there from the shaft, as the patient hit the ground, the condyles uh, splayed out and the shaft punched out through the skin. If you see that, then you know there's a big hole in the triceps there 90% of the time. This is that patient. They, they were initially uh, washed out and, and sewn up at a peripheral hospital and referred for definitive care. And on the right-hand side, you can see this big defect in the triceps muscle, which I'll show you a bit more up close now. So this tells you two things. Number one is if you're looking for dirt or contamination, then typically you're going to see that in the shaft. The joints are well protected here. The condyles are probably well protected. There's no um, open air in, in the joint itself or there may be a little, but it's not the direct inoculation or contamination. That occurs in the shaft. That's the part that hit the ground. And you can see here in the end of the shaft, there are two little chunks of uh, the person's shirt actually uh, there. And you need to clean and debride that area and focus on that area when you're doing your debridement. The second thing is that there's a large uh, or big hole of varying degrees of size in the triceps. And we always felt it would make sense to use that defect in the approach rather than doing an osteotomy immediately adjacent to it. So you can use this in your approach and we'll show you the tricep split approach for this type of fracture next. Now, this is a different case, but you need to use what's given to you. Now, obviously in this case, where there's a fracture of the olecranon, then use that as your approach to get into the joint. So use what's there uh, to augment your approach and to minimize surgical morbidity. And if there's a hole in the triceps, you can use that. If there's an associated olecranon fracture, then by all means, your osteotomy is made for you and you then would use that. So be flexible in your type of approach here. And if you, if you find that fracture is open, then again, the wound's posterior and you want to focus your debris out there. This is a close-up of that first patient shaft. And you can see right in the, in the uh, end of the shaft where the shaft came out, there's some dirt or debris and the, actually two pieces of the patient's shirt stuck right there in that defect. So this is the same patient. We've incorporated that big triceps uh, defect into a tricep split. And this, uh, agreeably, this fracture is a relatively simple one that you might have been able to do through a, a paratricipital approach. But I showed this just because it uh, is a very good example of this particular approach. And the kind of exposure that you're able to get if you do this, you can see very well down in the joint, you've left the electron intact. In an older patient, if you find that you simply can't fix the fracture, then you can convert this to an arthroplasty and have an intact olecranon. This is not something we would do for this fracture, which is a fairly simple pattern, and you can get a good reduction, and you can see we reduce things and held it with K-wires. There's a small gap on the lateral column because that's where that contamination was. We simply rongeered that fragment of bone away to ensure that we have a clean wound. I would say that you could argue about um, various advantages of parallel versus perpendicular plating that bicolumnar plating, however, is the gold standard, is the treatment of choice for this kind of fracture. And I think that there are some advantages to the parallel or as opposed to the perpendicular or 1990 plating system that we were all taught, including myself uh, growing up. These are the kinds of plate configurations you can use. You can see the far left is a parallel plate configuration. And on the other two, you have perpendicular or 90-90 configurations with a lateral plate and a posterior medial plate or a medial plate and a posterior lateral plate. So these are the kinds of plate configurations that I think one of these should be used for that fracture and that's become pretty standard. There are some advantages to, to the parallel plate technique and this is a, from a paper um, from JOT a couple of years ago looking at biomechanical stiffness. You can see they're both pretty good but in a gap model there's significantly more stiffness with the parallel plating. So if you're trying to get stability, then you have about a 10 or 15% advantage in terms of mechanics 
with the parallel plating system. And that's what we use for this particular patient. You can see that we have two plates on, one on the medial column, one on the lateral column. Then this allows us to put screws that are 40 and 50 millimeters of length into that distal fragment and corral it or cradle it between the two plates. And if you under contour your plates a bit, when you get the screws placed up in the shaft, you get this tremendous compressive effect distally, which really is very beneficial for stability. Probably not critical in this fracture, which is a simple pattern with good bone, but an older patient or with multiple comminuted fracture fragments, the parallel plating really in my hands or our hands is a major advantage. And this is that patient post-op. They interestingly had a small uh, a coronoid fracture that we fixed that medial lip of coronoids fixed as well. And you can see we have good stability and early healing. And this patient is essentially allowed to move uh, pretty well right away after this surgery. We are careful with resisted extension because of the triceps. You have to put that back down through drill holes. What about the ulnar nerve? So when I give this talk, people always say, well, you know, what do you do with the ulnar nerve? Well, I have a lot of patients with ulnar nerve pathology. How do you minimize that, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll say this. It's mandatory to find and protect the ulnar nerve throughout the case. So you have to find the nerve, you have to neuralize it, you have to protect it throughout the case. My patients had a lot of postoperative nerve symptoms, as I'm sure some of your patients do. And we thought, well, should we transpose it or not? When I worked with Dr. Jupiter, he initially transposed it, and then he had some issues with what he felt was an ischemic neuritis, where the nerve was stripped off for a prolonged uh, section and it didn't like that very much. And so he started being more minimalist in his approach. So really, we don't know whether it's a good idea to transpose or not. And so this is our same patient. Again, you see, we've sewn up the tricep split. Those ethabon sutures are drill holes through bone there. So we have the nerve sitting there at the end. What do we do with the ulnar nerve? You can see it here in this picture. Well, we did a randomized clinical trial. And I think this trial has just been published in JOT in the last month or so. So we took 60 patients who had this injury and randomized them to a simple decompression of the nerve, then leaving it in situ versus the decompression with an anterior transposition. The mean age of the patients in the study was 52 and most were female. And there was no difference between the two groups with any of the things that you might expect to uh, affect nerve function, gender, age, BMI, smoking, diabetes, et cetera. So they, they were a fairly cohesive group and the randomization scheme worked well. This is a lot of work, but it boils down to this. If you look at the ulnar nerve entrapment scores, and this is the one we use, the Gable and Amadio score, the green bar at the top or nine represents normal. So you can see that a lot of these patients have ulnar nerve scores that are far from normal, down in the six or seven range, but it doesn't seem to make much difference at any time point, whether you decompress the nerve or whether you transpose it. So it's mandatory to find the nerve, and to uh, neuralize it and protect it throughout the case. But at the end of the case, it would appear that it doesn't make a lot of difference whether you decompress or transpose the nerve. And also in most patients, they have significant nerve symptomatology, but it doesn't prove with time. So you can see most patients at six months or at baseline have a score of six. By the end of the study, a year out is around eight. So it does get better in most patients, but it's not normal. So I usually warn my patients about this preoperatively, no difference. And it made no difference to the overall male elbow score. And you can see here in this group, we had a pretty good outcome. We had a male elbow score of close to 90 in our patients, which I think is a success and this very difficult to treat fracture. So what about TEA? So often people ask me as well, when do you use a, a TEA? And I'll say this, for a comminuted C3 fracture in an elderly female, a TEA is better than trying to fix that fracture. So this is a fracture with multiple intra-articular fragments. So you have to have more than two fragments. So the patient I showed you before is not a candidate. It's a simple fracture pattern, good quality bone, younger patient. That's a fix every time. But if you have this specific subgroup, elderly females, and they're usually female, with a bad fracture, a TEA is better. And we did a randomized trial looking specifically at that that we published almost 15 years ago uh, in the JSES. This is a typical kind of patient you can see is older 78 year old female, multiple joint fragments. You can see the capitellar piece sneaking up the shaft there, the chocolate piece has been spit out. And in our hands, the TEA is a much, much better operation. You can do it much more quickly. You can leave the triceps attached. You can move them immediately. You don't have to worry about fracture healing. You don't have to worry about prominent hardware. And those patients did better. 
If you look at the Mayo Elbow scores, and this was uh, a 40 patient randomized study. Again, I think 35 were female. The average age was close to 80. You can see that the Mayo Elbow score is better at all time points and continues to be better out to two years. But this is both a statistically significant improvement and a clinically relevant improvement of 15 or 20 points at most uh, time points. And how quickly these patients get back is really very gratifying. If you look at it categorically, you can see that there's also a better categorical uh, outcome. You can really make a TEA patient almost excellent or good every single time. What about long-term? So one of the major issues with these patients is what about the our arthroplasty long-term? If you look at this graph, this is what happened to our patients. We had 20 patients in each group. One died early. Of the 20 patients randomized to fixation, five could not be fixed. And so intraoperatively, we had to bail out to a TEA. So if anything, the TEA group here is penalized by having the five worst fractures in them from the fixation group. So we ended up with 25 patients in the TEA group and 15 in the fixation group. And now if you look at long-term, so we recently looked at these patients long-term and published on that again, I think it was in the JSES recently. We had 11 uh, patients die with no revisions. We had eight alive with no revisions. We had six lost to long-term follow-up, although one of those had an early revision for infection. So as far as we know, on average, if you have a 78-year-old female patient with a C3 fracture, one out of 25 of these patients treated with TEA had to have a revision. Most of them uh, were very good and with no other complications down the road. So really only one revision in the 25 patients. And a lot of them died with their elbow in place, functioning well, never had to have anything else done. So this is a, a long-term outcome, which is pretty favorable for these uh, individuals. On occasion, lastly, I'll say that you have a patient with pre-existing arthritis will stain a fracture. And this is one of those rare occasions in trauma where you can actually make a person better than they were pre-injury by performing a TEA. This is a rheumatoid patient of mine who I'd fixed her, uh, her other shoulder, and I think her hip, and she fell and broke her distal humerus. And I was going to fix it, frankly, this is a number of years ago. And she said, you know, my, my elbow was painful and stiff before this. If you fix it, it'll just be painful and stiff again. Is there not something better than that? And we did a TEA on her and she was dramatically better after her fracture than she was before it, which is a rare opportunity for us in the trauma world to make someone better. So I'll stop there and thank you very much for your attention. Sir, please unmute. Dr. Sundar, would you please unmute yeah. yourself? Yeah, sir, thank you for your wonderful lecture. And we'll have some few questions. So one is that, what is the preferred approach for you if it is a bit comminuted uh, when you're trying to fix it? What is the preferred approach? I, I use the tricep split that you saw there. So I'm, I'm pretty much, uh, I haven't done an osteotomy in a long time. And uh, I do a tricep split for pretty well every one of these fractures now. And you can see very well, um, Maybe the one exception might be capitellar shear around the front can be a bit hard to see, but once you've done a number of them, uh, this is by far and away my preferred approach. I don't have to worry about the osteotomy of the olecranon healing. It doesn't take extra time to do that. I don't have to worry about the hardware of the osteotomy being prominent and painful. And if I want to switch to an arthroplasty, an older patient, I could do that without difficulty. And that happens in our study. One time in four, we went in there with the idea that we're going to fix this fraction, we simply could not fix it. We had to bail it to an earth class here. The electron's intact in that setting, so it's a good good approach for that as well. So even if there's a capital S here, you would uh, go by that, and then you will be managing to fix that also? Correct. So now that I've done a lot of them, I can still do that. You can you can take the um, electron and pull out with a towel clip, and then once you get the rest of the uh, distal humerus fixed, you can actually milk that capitellar piece back and then fix it back to front. And so I'm not perhaps recommending it for the first few that you do. Um, and, uh, and there are some tricks to, to making it work. Uh, but once you've done a number, there's really very few fractures you can't fix with that kind of approach. Any questions from the panelists? Yeah, Professor Mackey, one more question. Regarding, you told that there is no difference between anterior transposition and not doing. So many a times we got implant over the medial epicondyle area. So is there a chance of getting a friction neuritis? The, the implant and all now is that the probability? No, not that we can tell. So we had enough, like in the, in the series, we had 
most of those uh, plates, most of those cases where we left the nerve on situ on top of a plate. And we usually try and get some, you know, soft tissue uh, between the nerve and the plate, but there's some of the plate was and the nerve were in direct contact and it didn't seem to make much difference, okay. which is, you know, counter, that's not what we would have thought. We would have thought like you thought, but the bottom line is that you can leave it in situ. You can transpose it. It doesn't make much difference to the nerve. A lot of patients have symptoms. We still need to get better at doing this because we still have a lot of patients with nerve symptoms, but, you know, transposing doesn't protect them from having the nerve symptoms. Okay. That's my key. So uh, I'm also doing only the Campbell tricep splitting approach or the tongue splitting approach, but uh, what, the only time I do a olecranon osteotomy is when there is a coronal split of the trochlear fractures. Do you encounter that? Do you also do that or? Yeah, so that's absolutely the hardest part. So if you're doing a tricep split and the olecranon is still intact and you have, you have coronal pieces in the front of the capitellum or the trochlea, that's a major issue. I, I have found that with time, if you improve your, if you release the soft tissue more around the side and you can take the olecranon with a towel clip and just pull it back, once you've got maybe the, one of the columns established, you can get those anterior pieces back up. That's after you've done a lot. So if you have a fracture like that with those anterior coronal pieces, you know, an osteotomy is still a very good solid way to go uh, if you are unclear, unsure that you can get them through the split. Now that I've done it a lot, I don't think it's a big deal, but when you're starting out, uh, I would probably still recommend an osteotomy. And that remains the gold standard for exposure, no question. We have an audience question. How do you approach an intracondylar fracture with a brachial artery injury? How do you approach that? With a brachial artery injury. The brachial artery injury. So fortunately in adults, that's relatively rare. I think that's mainly a kid's, a kid's issue where you have a supracondylar fracture and, and the shaft in the kids, it's entirely different. The shaft goes out the front, not the back. And so in kids, it's a, you know, a more of extension type injury. So you get the, the injury in the front. I don't do a lot of, of, of children, uh, you know, 14 or so is probably the youngest uh, people I operate on. So I don't see that very often, frankly, but what my goal there would be essentially the principles would be to establish some bony stability promptly and then have your vascular surgeon fix the artery. Most of the time, uh, it's not a complete tear. It's a, it's a stretch or a bruise. And, and the artery, if you just bathe it in some paparavin or antispasmodic, it'll come back. Occasionally, it's a complete tear. Even in children with a complete tear, often the hand is still viable. And so then you have to make a decision whether it's worth fixing or not. So I'll, I'll defer that to anything further to someone who has more experience in it than I do. So what about a bone loss in the fracture in particular that's a, in our osteoporotic bone, there's going to be some bone loss. How are you going to deal with the bone loss? So that's an excellent point. If, if there's bone loss in the middle of the trochlea, I just leave it alone. The key thing here is to get the two ridges of the trochlea together. That's the most important part of the elbow. The, the elbow runs off those two ridges. If you've lost some capitellum, it's not a big deal. It's like a reverse radial head excision. Your, your elbow is going to be okay. If you get the two ridges of the trochlea where they are, so the ulna can sit in them, that's all that matters. And that's the, that should be the, in a situation where there's a lot of bone loss, that's the critical thing you should be looking for. If there's defects in the middle, in the bottom of the valley, I don't really care about those too much. I leave them alone, frankly. The only time I really get excited is if I don't have one of those ridges, because then the elbow will subluxate in, in the elbow joint will subluxate because you don't have one of those back. And then you've got to be inventive to try and make something to get that ridge back. Fortunately, it's relatively rare for that entire ridge to be missing, but that's really what you want to do. And you don't want to over compress them. So if there's bone missing in the middle, don't take the two ridges of the trochlea and squeeze them together to get rid of that gap. Don't do that because that makes a tight, unhappy elbow. Just put them back where they belong. If there's a bit of more slice graft kicking around, you can stick it in the defect, but really it's not that important. And I've got some patients where they have bone loss in the, in the middle and it's really not, not affected them at all long-term. If you have a, a ridge missing, then you have to get kind of creative. And usually I try and patch that together as best I can and then you know come back later and try and reconstruct it with an allograft or something of that nature. So that's a difficult issue late. Prashinkar Varibel, you have anything to ask or should we go with the next one? Oh, yeah. So I think we had a wonderful talk on, uh, and I thank uh, again Professor uh, Mickey for his wonderful talk. Thank you.
now we have the uh, we have uh, another uh, international faculty professor uh, rajan one right so more than talking about his academic achievement yeah you welcome and can you stay back for this discussion or we have yeah, please stay back for the discussion for some key you have time okay thank you yeah so the pleasant duty of introducing uh, professor uh, rajar van right so more than his academic achievement i was interested when i went through his cv that uh, he wanted to be a professional cyclist and he started his career as a physiotherapist and he broke the uh, broke both his shoulders and uh, his elbow and then he became interested and now he is a an authority and faculty international faculty for the elbow injuries he is a pioneer in arthroscopic surgery of the elbow and he has treated elbow injuries in many olympic and world champions international athletes he is well recognized for the development of his technique for repair and reconstruct of the unstable elbow as well as tendon repairs around the elbow he is currently involved in the development of a new elbow prosthesis he was the first president of the belgian shoulder and elbow surgeon society and has been the chair of the rehab committee and a member of the executive board of the european society of shoulder and elbow surgery over to professor roger thank you um, i hope everyone can see this and uh, thank you dr pamsi for the uh, for the invitation um it's obviously difficult to follow a uh, uh, professor mcky as he's one of the uh, the leading experts in elbow trauma of course so i was asked to talk about uh, lacrimal fractures and um I do have a disclosure. I'm a designer of, uh, with Acumet, as, as you mentioned, and I'm a designer of this uh, uh, temporary mobilizer by, uh, by Jake Design. So when we talk about the lacrimal fractures, we, we tend to think about this. This is a, a nice clear cut transverse lacrimal fracture uh, comes in, um, fall on the uh, mainly on the on the elbow itself, direct impact, and then I think most of us will think about um, think about. Uh, tension band wiring with the pinning of this uh, of this fracture <laughs> however you can do tension band wiring with screws you can do a small plate you can do a big plate or you can do an even bigger plate and all of these will do reasonably well if you uh, if you fix them with this clinical results don't really change with uh, respect to the implant used there's uh, about a 10 to 15 degrees extension deficit in the literature and less than 10 degrees flexion deficit and uh, funny you mentioned my cycling career um, I had a, a tension band wiring on, the, on my left elbow and I have no extension deficit, so I'm very grateful to the surgeon uh, who did it. However, there are some complications and uh, we all fear this complication, of course, the plate sticking through the skin or even uh, just, just some, uh, some hardware just underneath the skin. And uh, people always talk about plating and, and that they, that's one of the reasons why they don't want to do it because of this prominent hardware. And some plates have been developed that maybe um, uh, give less uh, prominent hardware. However, as a uh, like I said, as a uh, an expert uh, um, a patient uh, from from an electron tension band wiring, I can say that even the pinning really was annoying, and I was so happy when they took it out. Uh, this is not me, but this is one of uh, one of the patients that uh, came to me. And as you can see, pinning and circlage is not necessarily less prominent. It can uh, it can really hurt the patient, and this is not because the pins are protruding. This is because the 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 wire itself is uh, is straight underneath the skin. So maybe surprisingly, but complications are much more common in, um, in the tension band wiring when compared to uh, plate fixation. So tension bands uh, are removed in 80%, plates are removed in a significantly less amount of patients. Uh, maybe because it's easier to remove the tension band, that might be one of the reasons why people decide to just take them out, which is definitely what I do. Um, but um, you know, in some countries, taking out hardware is considered to be a complication. They prefer to leave it in. Besides removal of hardware, there's more ulnar nerve symptoms with the tension band wiring, more heterotopic calcification, maybe because the fixation is less uh, rigid initially. There's more instability, it's more post-traumatic arthritis, even the risk of infection, very surprising, not sure why, risk of infection increases. And one that's very important is loss of reduction. So you do your osteosynthesis because you want to have a perfect reduction, stable fixation, and then you end up losing it. Well, I have a referral practice, so many patients come refer to me with their, with their complications. And uh, I didn't have to look very far to uh, find complications with, uh, with this technique. So uh, as you can see, backing out of pins, but maybe less obvious, but there is some um, calcification at the radial tuberosity, which is very, very common. 
breakage of pins, uh, uh, as you can see here, secondary displacement. So this becomes from a very simple, relatively simple fracture becomes a difficult fracture to fix. Radial impingement, like I said, that's extremely common um, and should be avoided because it's actually relatively easy to avoid this. If you put your pins in like this and you just rotate the forearm at the, at the end of the procedure and you feel some crepitus or you feel something cracking, then it's not good. So take, a, uh, take an x-ray fluoroscopy or maybe don't, just take them out and, uh, and, and replace them and see whether that crepitus is still there. Because once calcification has, has grown, uh, it becomes more difficult to treat and, and sometimes simply removing the pins is not enough. Like I said, it was very easy to find uh, complications with, uh, with, uh, with our pinning techniques. <clears throat> if you make a mistake and uh, leave the pins a little bit proud and you stick them into the radius, that's not as bad as this. If you stick them into the over nerve, that's obviously worse. So uh, make sure that you do not do this. Uh, these pins were actually uh, not in the nerve, but against the nerve, causing uh, terrible symptoms for the patients and uh, not surprisingly causing uh, uh, a flexion deficit. This one's even longer. I'm not sure what they, uh, what they were thinking, but uh, uh, it came out for, you know, more than half of the pin was out. Luckily, not in the nerve. So this one's worrying. Secondary displacement. You can also ov obviously wonder if the displacement uh, or if the reduction was perfect initially anyway. But if you do a tension band wiring, then at the end of the case, like I said, take it through range of motion for rotation, look for crepitus, and bend it. Just bend it up as far as you can. And if it already starts displacing on the table, well, you can be sure it's going to displace once the patient wakes up and the tricep starts firing. This is an elderly patient, luckily, and uh, we left him alone. But if this happens in a 28-year-old, in a that's uh, game over for the elbow, and, and you're not really sure how to, uh, how to fix this in a young, young patient. Like I said, clinical results are, are fairly similar, uh, irrespective of the implant used. Um, they're generally very good. In 75 to 80 percent, they're really good, and 97 uh, percent in simple fractures. 95 percent will heal without problems. This is actually my own elbow when I fractured my radial head. That was 10 years after uh, my lacrimal fracture, when the, uh, the obviously the pins had been removed uh, between the seasons. <clears throat> and as you can see. Uh, no problem with the electron and uh, full function with the, with the elbow. So I'm not advocating against uh, tension band wiring, definitely not, but uh, be careful because this is the most important thing. 75 to 80% is good, but 97% is good in simple fractures. And that's very important in simple fractures. There's probably nothing better than a tension band. However, in non-simple fractures or complex fractures, uh, they, will, they can be very, very poor. And electron fractures are not only the simple, nice uh, transverse fracture that you just saw, electron fractures can be a combination of problems, and then you need a combined solution. This patient on x-ray, I'll show you the x-ray later, uh, it looks like a very simple, almost non-displaced with a left fracture over the CT can shows a significant portion of the, of the corner being fractured as well. This is a different patient, and he, uh, it's, it's, um, it's actually a strange story because he, he was operated, he fell, he was, he was a policeman, he fell, he was operated in a different hospital, and uh, he, had a, he had a weird feeling about his elbow and he basically fled the hospital with his uh, surgical gown still on the day after surgery. And uh, we took an x-ray and then this CT scan. And as you can see, the intermediate fragment here is uh, 90 degrees displaced. So this uh, humerus is articulating against bare bone. This fragment, the proximal fragment has not been reduced and has hardly been fixed. There might be part of the pin still in, in, a, in a tiny corner of the, uh, of the fragment. Um, but even if you want to ignore this, you cannot ignore this. The elbow is dislocated, the coronoid is gone, and uh, this elbow will never be good if it's left like this, if it left to heal. This is one of those patients that will, uh, that will um, dislocate in the plaster, of course. This is a little bit less um, spectacular, I guess, but nonetheless, still bad for the patient. This is not a good indication for, for attention band wiring. Um, the transverse fracture that I showed, the simple fractures, Excellent indication. Proximal ulnar fractures or more comminuted or combined fractures, very poor indication. Another example here, there's an elderly lady who was fixed with uh, tension band wiring, as you can see uh, on the lateral x-ray, uh, not reduced or lost reduction. Um, and uh, it's very obvious from this x-ray, from the, from the AP x-ray, that the uh, anteromedial facet of the coronoid uh, has not been reduced or has uh, at minimum has not been fixed. 
So it has um, this place later on. And this is what happened within a few months. So this is very extremely fast post-traumatic arthritis because the uh, tension band wiring did not address the most important part of this fracture, which was the um, um, anteromedial facet fracture. So if you see this um, and you're not sure about, if you see an X-ray and you're not sure, just do a CT scan. CT scan will offer so much more information about things that maybe you don't see on a, on a simple X-ray. And if you then see this, so again, proximal ulnar fracture, so lacrimal fracture combined with a coronoid fracture, you need to fix all fragments. And this is where tension band is unable to do that. And you need either loose screws or in our case, we use a plate. You can see there's always, that's also a radial head fracture and there was a ligaments injury as you can see from the anchor. But um, uh, most importantly for this talk, you see the plate is on and we have two screws into that coronary fragment. So two screws through the plate into the coronary fragment, offering strong fixation of all fragments. And I have uh, absolutely no doubt that these patients uh, are able to move the day after surgery. So we let them, uh, we let them move, or we make them move actually. We don't let them, we tell them to have, they have to move for a good result. <clears throat> so plating, I showed you some complications of plate, prominent hardware, uh, plates um, uh, going through the skin. The plates has a, have the same problems as, um, um, as tension band wiring. If the indication is wrong, it's going to fail. And in this case, there was the wrong plate in the wrong, on the wrong place. So they put a plate on. Um, I think they try to avoid the subcutaneous uh, border a little bit. Um, to avoid uh, hardware uh, problems. However, by doing that, they missed the coronoid, they missed the anterior part of the, uh, um, of the uh, uh, ulna. And as you can see, the elbow is dislocated. And this is three months post-op. So by the time you got to me, it was, tr it was three months later. And then we had a very difficult revision where we uh, were unable to uh, fix the coronoid and we had to restore the coronoid with uh, pieces of other bone. So when you do a lacrimal fracture treatment, <clears throat> consider not only the lacrimal, definitely consider the lacrimal, consider the coronary process, consider the ulnar shaft, consider the radial head. You can have a, a lacrimal fracture with the radial head dislocation, as you know. Consider the ligaments, so you, you may be able to do a nice bony reconstruction, but if the elbow is still unstable at the end of the case, um, maybe you have to fix ligaments left and right. So just some examples. This is uh, what I prefer to do now. Um, uh, that's not uh, academic, it's because I hated the pins in my elbow. So we use a small uh, electron tension band plate, it's called. I have no financial interest with this uh, particular implant. It's very low profile and it's easy to do. Small incision with those little two hooks. I, uh, I tend to use them to put them in a triceps. You can pre-drill the proximal uh, fragment as well and uh, stick them in a little bit uh, deeper into the bone. Or you can just hit them with the mallet and they'll go in as well. So one screw, don't put it in uh, completely, put it in about two thirds, maybe a little bit more, compress the fracture as you can see. And then with that clamp in, uh, in place, we uh, put a quick screw in, in this case it was a locking screw uh, because it was an elderly lady with soft bone, but put a quick screw in and then your fixation is almost done. So even without the home run screw, you see how we have a, you have a decent uh, reduction of the articular surface and we have a, uh, a stable fixation so this patient can move. We then put the home run screw in and that helps us quite a bit because it adds extra compression and what it often does is it bends the plate a little bit so uh, you have a better um, uh, position of the plate against the bone. And those fragments heal without problems. This is a couple of weeks post-op, four weeks. The bruise hasn't healed yet but the, uh, but the elbow is uh, next to normal. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite patients, of course, because of my history. Uh, this is the Tour de France. A couple of years ago, he crashed. Uh, I was actually sitting on the couch watching it, and um, um, I get a phone call from his wife around this point. He had an X-ray in the uh, in the mobile lab that the Tour de France has just after the finish, and that was his X-ray. And this is his uh, this is his uh, uh, CT scan. Well, the problem was that six weeks later he had the, um, the world championships. So this is two days post-op. Uh, I was obviously scared of the wounds because he's sweating on his bike. I was very scared of, uh, of him getting back on the bike uh, uh, riding. 
but uh, within six weeks he, he healed as most people do and he made it to the uh, to the world championships this is a bit more challenging and this is one of those cases where you look at the x-ray and think oh that's maybe not too bad but this was the ct scan that i showed you earlier so actually a highly combinated uh, proximal ulnar fracture combinated rail head fracture elderly patient again poor skin uh, lots of swelling I tend to do these in lateral decubitus. I prefer, prefer that so I can stand up straight. I'll try to anyway. Uh, you see this, the extensive soft tissue damage. This is not from the surgery. This is really everything is ruptured. You see how the ankyne is on the lateral side has exploded. And um, we can just look inside, this, you know, inside the joint there. This is quite an old video with older implants. Uh, so we detach the uh, annular ligament a little bit further from the um, uh, from the ulna, so we have a posterior appro approach, more or less similar to a void approach to the radial head. Get an excellent view. At this point, the radial head is obviously dislocated, dislocated posteriorly. You can think about fixing the radial head, <clears throat> but in this case, it was quite common, it was a very soft bone again. Repair the canal. Um, the implant that I used in this patient is no, is no longer available, but the, the, the principles are the same. Perfect height. And the height of the radial head has to be on the less sigmoid notch with the arm in neutral, so perfect height. And then we start reconstructing the ulna. First start with reduction of the coronal process. And as you saw from CT scan, that was a very big fragment. So we're able to uh, basically fi uh, fix the coronal process together with uh, part of the, uh, of the shaft to the ulna. Because it was quite a big fragment, we were able to put two screws in and get a really strong fixation. So just some nice screws and uh, similar to any type of fracture we, we're trying to create instead of having a multi-fragmentary common fracture we're trying to create uh, just two fragments in this case the proximal ulna and the, and the olecranon so it becomes it almost becomes a, a simple electron transverse fracture like this also teeth in this fracture so quite easy to reduce and then we uh, in this case we use the big plate because obviously we wanted to get more screws into that uh, proximal ulnar fragment. Home run locking, sc locking screw. Uh, you can, you can uh, use different screws, different plates, of course, if you, depending on your, uh, your preference. And then this is important because the LCL, LUCL, and annual ligament attach more or less together on the, uh, on the proximal ulna. You do need to fix it uh, strongly because you want to have a perfectly stable um, elbow at the end of the case so this patient can start moving straight away or as soon as possible so just to conclude electron fracture treatment it is a variety of pathology and uh, can be treated in different ways on the left as a conservatively treated one um, there's some papers now saying that an elderly patient can actually treat displaced fractures as well. And we've done, I, I honestly have only done it in uh, medically unfit patients and the results are okay. They're not great. They're not as good as surgery in my hands at least, but uh, they are, the patients do well and at least they don't get any complications from the surgery. Um, you can use tension band wiring um, with the uh, pins if you want. Um, still a very, very good uh, way of treating these fractures in simple fractures. I can't stress that enough. And I think if, if you take home one message from, uh, from this talk, simple fractures, it's, uh, it's probably the, the, the cheapest way and the best way to fix these, uh, fra uh, these fractures. Make sure that you move the elbow at the end of the case. So make sure that the fracture is stable, but also make sure there's no crepitus or impingement against the radius. If you're not 100% sure that it's not in the, on the nerve, then back it out and put it somewhere else because that's something that has to be avoided. And you don't want to figure that out afterwards. Um, on the third image, the middle, let's say a tension band screw. I thought that was the option. That was the best option uh, for uh, for a while, but very shortly because removing those uh, tension band wires, uh, then, uh, those screws is, is almost impossible. So uh, uh, we stopped using that. Then on uh, the one next to that is the little uh, tension band plate that I use um, in in our um, normal, for, let's say, simple fractures, and then if needed. You can use anatomical place and you can go as far as you want with that. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Professor Udre, you want to? Yeah. Professor Roger, that was an excellent talk. 
I just want to add one query. What's your take on using uh, uh, non-observable sutures or tapes instead of stainless steel wire for tension band wiring? Yes, um, that's an excellent question. And I think there's probably not a lot of difference between the two in, uh, in uh, force. So if you uh, want to use non-absorbable suture, that's fine. Um, I personally, like I said, I don't use tension band wiring very often. Um, I think the only advantage of using a, 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 using a, a real wire or, or is, um, is that you can fix them or you can compress it quite nicely, which sometimes a little bit more difficult with the suture. There's an all suture technique as well. Uh, Adam Watts from uh, from the UK described an all suture technique with with excellent results, really excellent results in those uh, simple fractures. And uh, they're doing a, a randomized control study now to see if it's uh, if it holds up in other people's hands as well. But Adam is a very very good surgeon, so he's able to do that without any problems. And uh, maybe that's going to be the next uh, the next gold standard in in the future. But we'll wait and see. Prof, you never mentioned about uh, dual plating, parallel plating. Uh, you never use it, or do you have any indications for that? I used it a couple of times and um, went away from it because I thought that the, uh, the soft tissue um, approach is, is huge. You have to you have to really do a bigger approach to do those parallel plating, medial lateral to the to the um, On the medial side, the ulnar nerve is in the way, whereas if you use a central plate. I can sort of leave the, ner the nerve alone, different to what, uh, what Mike just said with distal humerus fractures, then you have to find the nerve. What I do not with olecranon fractures, I obviously identify the nerve, I palpate it, I know exactly where it is. If there's too much swelling and I'm, I'm not 100% sure, I'll do a small uh, release of the nerve so I'm 100% sure where the nerve is. Where, whereas if you use medial plates, you sort of have to really uh, detach uh, the soft tissues and. Uh, the times I've used it, I, I didn't feel uh, comfortable with, uh, with the post-hop um, um, stiffness that it, that it gave me. So they, they, in my hands, they were more stiff than the simple ones that I, than the plates that I use, even the, uh, the bigger uh, anatomical plates. Roger, if I can ask, a great talk, by the way, and I, I agree completely with you. When do you use a separate plate for the coronoid <laughs> fragment versus just lag screws, as you showed, kind of along the lines of the double plating? When do you use a separate plate for the coronoid? Yeah, that's, that's a good question, and I'm very happy to say that that's very rare for me. Uh, but when the coronoid is comminuted, you have no choice. You have to use some buttress, and you have to sort of cover the coronoid with, uh, uh, with a plate and uh, sometimes add sutures as well. If it's too small for a, for, to, to hold a screw, then you have no choice, and you sort of have to put a plate over it, next to it. Uh, use smaller screws. Uh, I've used pins as well. And... Um, so then with the comminuted uh, coronary fracture with small fragments, as they sometimes are, um, then, we use, then we might use a plate. But then it's, diff it's a different approach. And then you have to find the nerve, of course. You have to go to the side. I, do, I still go over the top, but I do find the nerve. I think it's, I, I prefer to, use, uh, to really see the nerve when I use coronary plates. Did you say you had a question? No, oh, no. He answered it. He wanted to use a different approach. So, so. So, uh, Prof, uh, how do you how do you manage the bone loss in the electron? And how much of bone loss is accepted, and uh, how much is not accepted? <clears throat> and bone loss, how do you reconstruct it? Yes, I don't worry too much about the bone loss. Um, um, I try uh, one of the, the things with bone loss is if you uh, if you um, then put a plate on, or if you use a tension band wiring even more, you tend to compress. So you need to make sure that you that you still open up the uh, the olecranon itself, so it can hold the humerus inside. If there's bone loss and you're compressing, which is which is very attractive to do, because you think, okay, I've got a nice compression on my uh, on my bone, uh, but then you get a poor result because the the olecranon, the greater sigmoid notch simply becomes too small for uh, for the humerus, and you get a very you know get a very stiff elbow. So what I do then is I tend to almost uh, like uh, like Mike described, you know, the, the train reel um, hypothesis where you have an, on the medial side, uh, in, the, in the distal humerus on the medial side, you have your trochlea, on the lateral side, you have your capitellum, so we don't worry about the middle. I sort of do the same with uh, bone loss in the center. So if it's, uh, if there's central bone loss, it's the bare area. Anyway, in most patients, I kind of avoid it. I kind of uh, uh, um, I don't look at it. I just... Make sure that I have a nice compression on the back if I can. And otherwise, if I can't, then I'll use some bone graft. Okay, Prof. Sangar and Sibin, do you have any questions to ask or should we go to the next talk? Yeah, well, just Prof. one more question. 
you have shown that when there is commonly there is sometimes you find radial head fractures out there and you have shown one replacement suppose you plan to fix a radial head will you go through the same approach or same window and go laterally and fix it so if you want to fix yes. it yes I need to be, uh, that, that's i actually don't mind that too much so i use void approach uh, from the posterior side and um, and fix the radial head from the back it's actually as long as the um, as you do it first so what you do is you get your it's like an electron osteotomy so you basically just open up your electron in that way you're able to do um, nearly always very easy to uh, dislocate the elbow uh, post lateral if you're not 100% uh, um, satisfied with your with the way you look at the radial head what you do then is you cut the annular ligament like i said and the attachment of the LUCL is attached to it so then you you uh, create very severe postlateral rotatory instability. You create that with your blade, and then uh, and then you dislocate it. One of the things that I have to say is that sometimes when you have more fragments, um, um, it can be difficult. So as soon as you fix the radial head, it can be difficult to reduce it, and it's sometimes quite scary to reduce it because you have your fragments and you made a nice puzzle, and then pushing it back in. Um, I I nine out of ten times I look at it again because I'm afraid that I um, that I did something to my radial head. So what you do is you open it up, use the osteotomy that nature made. If there's a coronoid fracture, address it at that, at that point, um, and then um, dislocate the elbow and do a, um, uh, do a radial head fixation. And then finally, use a plate or your tension band, whatever you need. Perfect. Roger, sometimes uh, the uh, volatron is so much of ammunition. But do you ever use uh, some sort of circlage wiring around that area to get the, all the fragments mm -hmm. together? Yes, at the beginning of the, ca of the case, of course, we use yeah. sutures, and pins, uh, we use whatever we need to uh, fix it. But what I found with, even with comminuted fractures, you, you always have something to squeeze in, squeeze it into. And uh, the, um, those little fragments tend to be stable at the end of the case because of the compression that you gave from the proximal and the distal, uh, and the distal fragments. But in the beginning, yes, you use whatever you need to uh, to get your uh, reduction. Dr. Singhar, do you want to go with the next talk? Yeah. Uh, so I think we can move on to the next talk. Dr. Raja, please, uh, sorry. Dr. Raja, please hold on. We have a case discussion after this talk. Yeah. Yeah, please go ahead, Stephen. Sorry. Guys, yeah. guys, uh, thanks very much for the invitation. I'm sorry I have to sign off. I got another commitment, but it's been a great session, great talks, and thank you so much for uh, inviting me again. And it's great. Thank Hopefully, you. we'll see everybody in person soon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank, thank you. Bye. Right, right. Take care. Bye bye now. So, good evening to one and all. Uh, first of all, I thank the organizers of OASIS team for giving me this opportunity to be the panelist on this wonderful podium. And without much wasting the time, uh, let me take this opportunity to introduce our next speaker, Professor Dean Dian. He is an international tra trauma surgeon of international repute, as we all know, currently working as the head of the trauma service at Ganga Medical College, Ganga Medical Center, situated at Coimbatore. Uh, he has special interest in polytrauma, complex limb surgeries, shoulder surgery. He has many laurels to his repute. He's currently the AO Trauma Education Officer. He was a past president of Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Association. He is a founder member of uh, trauma section of APOA and past editor of Tamil Nadu Orthopedic Journal. And he has a rare, it is a, he has a rare honor to be the one of the few Indian surgeons to perform live webcast of nailing in open fractures from Switzerland. He has many publications, national and international. So welcome the Indian sir, and the stage is all yours. Thank you. I thank all the OSS TraumaCon organizers for giving me this opportunity. And more importantly, to give a talk along with Professor Mackey and Professor Roger Von Reyert, who are elbow surgeons of great repute. It is a big honor in itself. Terrible triad injuries, by far, you know that they have been named terrible purely because either they have a persistent instability or they may end up with some amount of stiffness or heterotopic ossifications. And also, like, they, when they come late to us, or even after surgery, some of them might end up having some sort of an ulnar nerve neurofraxia and so on. So like that, there were a lot of problems. And when it persists, it can also end up with arthritis. And all these account, these were called actually Bob Hodgkiss. He termed it as a terrible triad. 
terrible triad is something like an elbow dislocation with coronoid fracture and also the radial head fracture. This combination is the terrible triad. So the terrible triad in itself, if you look, the elbow to be very stable, it requires this an excellent video. And you can see that without all any other structures, you can see with only the ligament and also the bony anatomy, it is very stable. The, especially the posterior one, that is the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, and also with the, that gets it's a wide structure, and it has got an anterior, posterior, and then the annular. They all form as a single unit. But most important is the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, which which is attached to that supinate or comes on down and attached to the supinate crest. So this is very important because see like it is posteriorly placed to the radial head and it gives a very good support for the radial head and also it is it is like a holding like a cradle. On the medial side, so there is a frag, that is the anterior band of the medial collateral ligament attaches to the surface. sublime tumercle is a very important portion. They form the primary restraint. And also the bone, if you say the uh, greater sigmoid notch, the curvature of it, and also which is anteroposterior and also mediolateral curvature, they make it a very good congruent joint. And hence, they perform a very good stable portion of your elbow joint. If you look at here, see like, as I said, it is a bony anatomy. It is a volecranon and the coronoid, which are a good restraint. And also LCL and then the MCL on the one side. So they form the primary restraint for your joint. They give the major stabilizers. If you take the radial head, Suppose if the medial collateral ligament is not there, it becomes a primary stabilizer as well. Basically, you call them as the secondary stabilizer. But if the medial collateral ligament is not there, they form the primary stabilizers. So this by Mori et al, if you see, like when everything is intact, you can see that the joint is there, the medial collateral, lateral collateral, and also the forearm stability. Forearm stability in the sense, the proximal, distal, and the middle, segments of your joint, if it is good enough, then the joint is very stable. On the contrary, suppose if the radial head is removed and if the forearm is nicely intact, along with the medial and lateral collateral ligament, still it is a stable joint. Whereas when there is a longitudinal instability, like for example, is a SX low porosity type of fracture, you can see that the radial head starts migrating, but the no humeral joint is intact. On the contrary, suppose if there is a medial collateral ligament is lost, even with the forearm in correct position, when the radial head is removed, you can see that there is a big lateral, that is the instability is there. So there is a valgusization. So that is why it is very important that radial head must be preserved in all these elbow uh, instabilities. And also, if you take the fracture per se, more of a volacranon fracture is occurring from zero to 30 degree of uh, flexion. Whereas radial head, more the flexion is there, the radial head fracture seems to be more. So this is one of the important message. And then also, if you look the radial head, when you are pronating, little bit of pronation that takes place, the radial head translates anteriorly. That is because the proximal radius is little angulated. So it translates anteriorly. And with the translated radial head and also the uh, coronoid process, they form a very good anterior buttress. So they give a good buttress and they resist your uh, instability part. So when it is broken, along with this collateral ligament, when it is torn, then the elbow becomes very unstable. So you all know this in all, all, the, all the pictures, you would have seen this, the way it is broken, it is a, axial load in a, a supinated and valgus uh, bone. So it is a supinated forearm, axial load with a valgus stress. You get this uh, first. Initially, the, there is a postrolateral rotatory instability. After that, as, the, uh, as if there is an anterior and posterior ligaments or the capsule that gets ruptured. And then when it is hinges on the MCL, you can get into a fractured so situations. And finally, the MCL also is lost. So this is the mechanism that has been described very well, and it is all called Hori cycle. You all know about it. What is important is having known this, now as the terrible triad from the time it was described as the terrible triad and now with the understanding of the pathology and also improvement in all the 
or mechanism by which we operate. And then the protocols that has been devised, we have found that it is extremely good uh, having a good outcome. And also clinical evaluation is very important. All these fractures always look for the medial elbow bruising. When there is a medial elbow bruising, if you see the, there is uh, almost always it will be having a medial uh, collateral ligament injury. So this is one of the case you can see that moment there is a medial elbow bruise, you could have seen this. And also if there is a longitudinal instability, instability that is the SX low precity type fracture, you must get the radial length correct. So you have to have a good fixation of the distal radius as well. And also you have to make sure that your fix, either radial head is nicely fixed or if you are replacing, it is extremely crucial for the radial head length to be maintained. So this is very important. And also the neurological examination. So as I said, they, there will be, it is very rare. So you don't see much of a neurological involvement in the elbow. That is a terrible type, type of situation. However, when there is a radial head that is broken and then splattered all around, and then some of the cases, I had one patient who had a radial nerve injury. And you can, I have already put one picture where the patient came very late and he had an ulnar nerve injury. So all these are possible, but it is a rare, rare thing, but you have to examine it. What is important is to establish the diagnosis. Now all these terrible triad injuries, moment you evaluate clinical examination, the radiography is the one that is done. But more than radiography, because of the complexity of these practice, and in any trauma situation, more the complexities, you have to have a CT scan done. Inaccurate preoperative diagnosis mainly because of the missed additional lesions. So, which is there. And also like CT scan is, uh, uh, suppose if you do a CT scan, it tells you everything. So you can see that in, you can rotate it in all the directions and see the anatomy. And then you can also know where exactly it is lost. Generally the radial head, it is the anterior portion because I said it is a very good buttress. It is the anterior portion that is uh, broken. And sometimes because of the uh, violence, extreme violence, yes, there can be combinations around it. And also you can see that you will also note that majority of the times it is the anterolateral corner of the coronoid that is broken. But if there is a medial side that is involved, you will know that you will have to do a medial approach. So it gives a very good, clear understanding. And also like, So the next one is the associated fracture. Sometimes there can be a capitular injury. Here you can see in this, there is a capitulum fracture, which is obvious, but many times you will have an impacted capitular fractures, which, which will not be uh, uh, seen immediately, which will be seen in a CT scan. Actually, Von Wright has uh, uh, produced a paper where he has associated fractures. He has described all the associated fractures that can come with percentages. It's a very good paper to read about. See, like what it says, when you have a 3D type of picture, it not only tells you this, see like writing classification, if you see, he has put the middle column as anterolateral column, anterolateral portion of your uh, coronoid. Purely because you see all of them here, you can see uh, everywhere, it is anterolateral column that is majority of the times it is broken. When it is broken like that, it is also easier when the radial head is also broken, you, it is easier for you to go ahead and then put your fixation through that approach from the lateral approach. On the contrary, down below, if you see a very good big chunk of uh, olecranon, you may have to approach with a different approach, anterior approach, or if there is a medial uh, a portion that is broken here. So here you can see this is the fracture segment. And then those has to be approached by then another approach. So you have a clear idea as to what exactly can be done with this. So this is a fracture. Initially it was close reduction was attempted, but you can see there was a persistent instability. And then again, a trans fixation was done, but however, it is not all right. So it was referred. And then you see that you take a CT scan, then you will get a fair idea of what exactly has happened. It will tell you where, where is the radial head fracture, what type of fracture, and also the coronoid segment, everything will be seen. By far, you will have a clear understanding of what is the coronoid fracture and what is the radial head fracture. You know that it is the regan morris classification. regan morris classification came as a purely radiological classification. After that, 
when with what is called classification that came as an, one of the concept of an anteromedial segment that came and also there was a modification for the regan morris classification as the fourth type it was a medial and lateral components were established in there and also for the uh, mason's classification for the radial hair so these things you can make sure and the mason's classification also got modified by hodgkins as the uh, with along with the whether there is a mechanical block for the rotation so based on that you can also plan what exactly can be done so exact diagnosis can be established and also professor macky he has put that protocol and all those protocols put together with better understanding and systematic sequential fixation like we know that now the terrible triads and needs to be fixed in this so you start from deeper to uh, superficial that is for the fixation of the coracoid then you come to the radial head and then finish the lateral collateral ligament lateral ulnar collateral ligament and then once it is done check the movements if the movement is good and up to 30 degrees of extension or even full extension if it is good enough then you have to you don't have to worry about a medial side fixation on the contrary if there is any dislocation that happens before the 30 degree of uh, uh, flexion then you need to think of a medial collateral ligament and also look for a medial collateral repair after medial collateral repair also is done then there is no other option but you have to maintain the joint properly if you are congruently maintain the joint suppose the mcl also is done if it is not congruently placed then you have to maintain it with an external fixator so often the uh, dynamic type of an external fixator is preferable but however if you don't have it doesn't matter even external fixator you can keep it for some time what is important is if you keep the congruent joint nicely reduced congruent joint collateral ligaments will heal it is always better to have a healed joint in a good position than an unstable joint so it is important that you get the joint properly reduced during surgery you have to do a fluoroscopy sometimes when you do a fluoroscopy you will see any subluxation that is taking place and also you can take a adequate uh, uh, adequate uh, uh, repair at that time and also if within the 45 degree range if the fluoroscopy if all the fixation is done and then it is uh, getting dislocated then there is no option but you will have to revisit your surgery so the red during the surgery you need to do a radius pull test that is a longitudinal stability when you are doing especially the a uh, radial head fixation or a replacement what you do is you use if you hold the radial uh, neck and then try to pull it longitudinally and see in, in, in along with the ulna if there is any uh, difference in the movement suppose if there is a movement then you will have to check the inferior radio ulnar joint as well and then you have to correctly diagnose it and then make it all right so now there is the same patient which i was uh, uh, focusing and you can see that once you do all the procedures done in a right uh, this thing systematic manner you get a good uh, movement and then they get an excellent outcome what is important is understanding diagnosis and then the correct sequence of approach if you do and then the key element is get your ulno humeral joint nicely reduced congruent reduction that is what is important of course the approaches are there lateral and the medial approach the lateral approach i am sure all of you know the common is the cocker's approach but often what happens is uh, i often you do a, a edc split approach but often there is a rent already the injury has produced a rent and then you can you can use that rent as an approach and then get your uh, 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 way along and then get the uh, fixation done on the medial side commonly used is through the ulnar nerve ulnar nerve split approach ulnar um, uh, flexor carpi ulnar is split you can use and then go on to the anterior side and then uh, fix it up so the methods by which you fix is the coronoid is the one that you start and you know the classification is the regan morris classification that generally is there. so type 1 is you use an either a suture anchor that you can use anterior you can go down and put a suture anchor or also you can put like a lasso technique you can bring it out and then use a the endo button or you can also make two holes and then tie it up with this so there are many methods there like that you can use whereas so this is one of the patient you can see that it has been uh, reduced and then is the endo button has been used 
and then you see the final result you can see they all get a very good result so perfect phenomenally good result you get only thing you need to do is to follow the protocols and then if you get it done it, there is no issue at all so the ring and suppose type 2 if you get again you can do the same if the uh, bone chunk is slightly bigger you can use the screw screw fixation also is a possibility and then you can once you do that then again only thing is whether you use the sutures anchors or the screw suppose if it is a very basal fracture and then if it is a wide fracture then you can also use a plate and then when they use and uh, if you have follow, followed the correct routine you all of them go on to have a very good result so what is important is once you manage the coronoid then you go on to the radial head management the radial head management you are looking at either a fixation or a replacement there is no question of excision especially when there is an inst instability is there forget about excision so if you excise it it becomes completely an unstable joint they will end up with a very poor result so you are left only with two options like fixation and replacement so the radio restoration of the radio capitular cooptation is very important that is the key aspect of elbow uh, in, in uh, fixations so here you can see this is a patient 39 year old who fell from bike they present after a, uh, they present after a week of time and then you can see there is a flake of uh, coronoid and also the radial head is broken over there and then what we intraoperatively we were not able to fix it so we have we can uh, uh, take it out and then nicely reduce it and then fix it back to position what is important is where exactly you put the plate on plate on is like you need to put it on the safe zones so often when you take it out there may be a, a, a possibility or a confusion as to where exactly you put the plate it is easy to see if you see the surface that is the side surface the articular margin wherever the articular margin is the narrowest that is the area you will put the plate so that will help you to put it and also when you are putting it back to position follow the lister tubercle your plate direction must be towards the lister tubercle if you follow that generally you, you are all right and also uh, this uh, here again you see this uh, uh, plate fixation that has been done so at 9 months you can see they get a very good movement here and this is a safe zone that i was explaining to you suppose if you are keeping it in neutral position in the neutral you can see that the tangential is drawn here anterior to it is uh, 65 degrees and posterior to it is 45 degrees that from the supination to uh, pronation and in this angle that is around 110 to 120 degree angle that is also the area where you have less of a articular margin and then you can also put a uh, plate over there and that is the arc of uh, that is a safe zone that you always have to remember to put your uh, plate on this is a 29 year old you can see here this is the uh, fixation the there is a fracture here and also it is comminuted you can you see the combination is more on the posterior side so when it is more on the posterior side you will have to think suppose you can't put a plate all around here so plate may be coming somewhere in this uh, somewhere in this portion the plate will be coming so here is to fix this fragment you can use a tripod type of a, a, a screw fixation like you can go from here and hold it on to the shaft and also here you see this is the uh, rent here and then that is the fragment that is on the medial side so when they were doing a 3d it has been taken off so this is the fragment that is there so you know that you have to go through the two approaches and then this is the fixation that we do and then you can see that this is in situ there it, it's fixed and then what we are doing is when we fix it here once the, the this is the screw the whenever there is a portion of the articular cartilage where you need to go through which is bigger where you cannot put a plate it is always good to you go through like this you can use either pins also you can use and this is the herbert screw that we have used uh it goes from the top of this cartilage and then ends on to the shaft here and you can use three screws without the plate also you can use three screws that also has given a good outcome and here you can see the when we are looking once the radial head is fixed when we were doing a valgus stress you can see there is a opening on the medial side so you know that because of that small fragment that is broken it is giving you the valgus instability 
valgus instability and then that hello sibin you are able to hear yeah yeah sir yeah. yes, sir you can continue and yeah. so so you can see that there is a valgus instability and then you can once it is sorted out by medial approach and then you, you go and repair the anterior band of the ulnar collateral ligament you can see that the nicely the joint gets congruently placed and this is the final outcome he gets you can see that entire flexion extension supination pronation everything gets retained elbow is completely stable and once you know that all this can be done nicely the radial head fracture if it is so more than three fragments suppose if it is more than three fragments then you may have to think of a radial head replacement still it can you can try to fix it but often you will end up doing a radial head replacement so this is a, a patient who had uh, multiple fractures you can do it is a big fragment but the portion that is here on the uh, multiply comminuted were not able to reconstruct it so this ends up with having a monoblock stainless steel type of a, a radial head replacement and then once you do it what is important is the length suppose you get the correct length <clears throat> and then you get the uh, radio humeral ulnar joint correctly congruently placed then for sure you are going to get a very good uh, movement the functional outcome will be extremely good so the radial head arthroplasty if you take what decides your arthroplasty is that comminuted fractures involving the whole head so where you cannot get a, a satisfactory reduction so you have to think of a replacement or if there is a partial head fractures with more than 30% of articular margin where radial head again cannot be reconstructed and then fractures with more than three fragments these are the basic rules by which you will have to think of a radial head arthroplasty once you figure out whether you have fixed or the replaced the radial head then you will have to fix the lateral ulnar collateral ligament so you can isometrically the middle of your uh, capitulum forms the isometric point you can put an anchor over there or you can also make a tunnel you can put a, a, a transosseous tunnel and get a fiber wire and stitch the lateral collateral ligament many times the lateral collateral ligament you see if when you are holding it try to hold posterior to the radial head when you are trying to hold the posterior a lot of the times you may not be able to see it but generally you can figure it out and then it must be able to hold the ulna so once you are holding the ulna and then try to repair it to the uh, lateral condyle it will be easily placed and then you repair it so it should be in all right and then again once all the things are done if it is stable enough then there is no need to go on to the medial side if it is unstable with the 30 degree of extension then you will have to open on the, the medial side and then medial uh, collateral ligament you will have to repair it sometimes even when you do the medial collateral ligament some there there may be a post stroke medial instability that still happens that happens because of the posterior band that is of the medial collateral ligament that is not being secured well it might happen so in those instances you will have to put a hinged elbow external fixator so that is the protocol that has to be followed and if you follow that there is no problem at all so based on the intraoperative stability that you have got during the surgery you can start moving the uh, immediately after second day you can once the drain is out you can start moving the elbow joint around 4 weeks time you might think of getting a complete extension with good forearm rotation and then after 8 weeks you, you start the resistive exercises that is the protocol that we follow here and and one of the concept that has come out is you should never forget that when there is the concept of that is a what is called first classified it and then postromedial rotatory instability this is the pronated and varus position when there is an axial load it can you can get it and more often it is the radial head may be intact <clears throat> and then the majority uh, and coronoid will be uh, broken on the medial side and this you need to think it is also a part of a terrible fright and then fix it the other part is the transolacronon type of <clears throat> fractures with coronoid and then the radial head sometimes they can also have and then you you will have to think of a fixation some of the uh, x rays also was put up by roger 
one row, one read. He also has explained about it. So all those you'll have to see. A part of it is like postrolateral instability, and this is the postromedial rotatory instability, and the other one is the transolacrinone type of dislocations. All these you'll have to think of managing it very well. This is the what is called concept of the medial facet, and that is you'll have to approach it through the medial side and fix it. And once you approach it from medial, because fixation of the medial anteromedial segment is very important because there are instances where early arthritis can take place and then stiffness or the pain will be very quickly seen in these patients if you have not managed it and also there are chondrolysis has also been reported in anteromedial facet fracture dislocation so i think anteromedial you must give a, a constantly you must look for that and then uh, get it corrected well so now, if you ask, if you ask me, like having said all these things, is there a role for a non-operative management? So there is a paper by Matthew et al. who said, if there is a minimal or an undisplaced fracture, there is no mechanical block to movement of of elbow and forearm rotation, concentrically reduced hulnohumeral and radiocapital are joined, and stable arc of motion up to thirty degree of extension. If all these criteria is there, still you can think of. Uh, getting go going ahead with uh, conservative management. However, Shukla et al. has said that radial head fractures, even if it is depressed by two millimeter or angulated by thirty degrees, they still there can be eighty percent chance of yes, loss of the concavity, compression, stability of the radiocapitular joint. So that is why it is very important to say that it is you cannot take anything granted. But it is always preferable to go ahead and operate all these terrible triad injuries. So, in summary, CT imaging improves understanding and helps in planning. Restoration of the ulnohumeral joint is the key. That is the standard. The radial head is important secondary stabilizer. It must be either fixed or replaced. Lateral collateral to be repaired in all cases. MCL repair or a hinged external fixator, depending upon the stability you have got. And if elbow subluxate within forty-five degree, you must revise the fixation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dean Dalan. That was a very difficult topic which I have extensively covered. Uh, I know it is very very difficult, and uh, you can only do that. So one quick question from me. So you said that about the radial pull test, and uh, once you have fixed the radius, you pull it and no. then find out. You no, no. Before you fix the radius, before you fix the radius, you can do it. Before you fix the radius, you can try to pull it. When you have removed the radial head, when you have removed the radial head, then only you can pull it and see against your ulnar segment. Suppose if you have fixed it, you can't pull it. You will have to take a distal X-ray and rule, and you have to analyze. So if there is an SX loper still lesion, then what will you do? If it is only a distal radial ulnar joint instability. Will you just wire it, or uh, how do you maintain it? No, in one of the one of the cases, uh, actually first case the, that I showed, they also had a sex low pressity. But you see, in that fracture, what we went to was initially we fixed the ra distal radius first. So once I fix the distal radius, I know that distal radius is aligned very well, and then I come back and fix the prox uh, radial uh, head. So now I know that I got the length. The situation comes only when you are replacing the uh, radial. radial head. When you are replacing it, sometimes you might go err on whether it is a smaller prosthesis or a bigger. Pro when you have, when see our, in our setup, we don't have a modular prosthesis. We have a fixed solid monoblock mono stainless steel type of a prosthesis. In this prosthesis, very difficult to adjust. So sometimes you may have. To add bone cement and then get the length all right. So, so you'll have to make some sort of adjustment. Till we get the modular prosthesis, we may have to do some adjustments like that. But getting the radial length is the key. You will have to get the correct length. Of course, a lot, lot, lot of techniques are there. You can see, like, moment you put the radial head, you help. You have to make sure that it is correctly lesser sigmoid notch must match topmost portion of the radial prosthesis must match the topmost area of your lesser sigmoid notch. And then when you have put it, you can also do the fluoro and see the uh, in, uh, in, uh, the humeral ulnar uh, distance on the medial and the lateral side. It should be congruently placed. 
there should it should not be overstuffed or a stretching of the me, uh, lateral set should not be there so these are the points that by which you can uh, check it out so sir one question uh, yeah sir in uh, you have shown the fixation of chip fractures of the only coronoid with the radial head suppose there is a slice fracture of the radial head and how do you approach the coronoid do you go through the middle part or is there another way you can't take out the whole radial head so if it is a slice fracture only one part type 2 mass and something like that then how do you fix it so no, see like when when we are not taking out the radial head also see these frag fragments that are there those who which have been anteriorly coronal slice has come off they are just staying away from you before you reduce it you can approach the olecranon and see so it's majority good. of the times so majority of the times it is anterior lateral corner of the uh, coronoid so one moment you go through it you can uh, see it through suppose if you are not able to see it is it is don't hesitate to go on to the medial side you can do the over the top approach or even the other approach and then get it done so you should not hesitate you must fixation is the key i think von rate can uh, explain it also because he has done lot of work on the elbow so all right i i wanted to uh, first of all congratulate you with the talk that was an excellent overview of all the uh, the things that that need that you need to know before you treat these patients because if you don't know the the biomechanics and you don't know um the the basis behind it there's no way you can have, you can have a good result and then and then you need to know all the approaches and then you need to know plan b and plan c and plan c and plan d um i totally agree with you what we what we do when we have a a small coronoid fracture and a radial head fracture is um my approach becomes a little bit bigger i try to do it from lateral side i i try to avoid the medial side because of stiffness again um but what you do is you go on the lateral side i do an extensor tendon split i don't use a coccus interval but an extensor tendon split and then it's very easy to just um uh, slide up the humerus release if it hasn't been torn yet you can release the capsule put a big retractor in and then you can see the medial side and you can see the coronary uh, process and um <clears throat> obviously do this before you do the radial head because you don't want to destroy your uh, your fixation and then you can either put a screw in from lateral side um which sometimes is difficult or you can um um do a lasso technique with a suture like was described by Dr. Mori and basically you're not treating the fracture as such but you're just uh, pulling down the anterior capsule onto the coronary process and and that sort of heals without problems and uh, it it greatly improves the um um the stability of the elbow afterwards one thing that i want to want to add is uh, something that i really personally really enjoy doing is uh, doing it arthroscopically and uh, so you go with your camera either at the beginning of the case but that's difficult because the elbow might swell or just from your lateral portal from your lateral uh, uh, from the lateral side you put your camera in and you can actually see all around uh, the the coronary process and you and you can see a reduction that's really really fun to do it it offers me more in uh, um in a view and more in uh, knowledge than uh, fluoroscopy so i tend to avoid fluoroscopy if i can um because it's sort of you know sometimes you can feel very happy on fluoroscopy and it doesn't look that good afterwards whereas arthroscopically there's no there's no hiding it it's good or it's, or it's bad you can't hide behind your uh, behind your scope the one more thing yes sir one thing And the writing the school says that uh, you need not fix the small chip fragment if you are stabilizing the radial side so what's your take on that no very often you don't need to fix it if it's uh, if you feel that you have a nice big chunky radial head fracture and and a very small chip fracture on your coronoid dr mori showed that type 1 uh, fractures do not need to be uh, need to be fixed um odriscoll made that a little bit more complex uh, as 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 often because he uh, showed us that some of those chip fractures might be posteromedial uh, or sorry anteromedial facet type fractures like was shown in previous presentation and and if you miss those that's a bad that's bad if you miss a chip fracture or you know what people some people call a volume fracture although it's not really an volume fracture that that's no big deal that's probably not a not a problem but it's is those fractures between type 1 more in type 1 and type 2 where you think ah oh, maybe i can leave it maybe not those fractures i'd like to use lasso technique sibir actually if you see like when there is a chip fracture suppose if it has to come dislocated like this you will see the lot of anterior capsule is all stop completely so it will not give any support so i think it is better to fix it and also one of the other point i 
uh, I have to make is like if you take a Cocker's approach, you are coming from posterior to anterior. So many times you may find it difficult to retract and see through. On the contrary, if you go through the EDC split, that is extensor digitorum communis split approach, you are more anterior. Your fracture is also anterior and you will also get the good approach to the olecran, uh, sorry, coronoid. Sir, yeah, one Definitely. question from the uh, delegates. What are the tips to avoid posterior intrusion in the palsy during plating of the radial? No, I didn't touch up on it purely because uh, I thought it would take time. But you see, like generally from the lateral condyle, suppose, suppose if the, from the lateral condyle to the radial nerve around 5 cm, or if you take from the top of the radial head up to the radial nerve area, it is 4 cm, you will have to be careful. So if you are, if you are, do it, it's okay. But suppose if you are going through the Cocker's approach or a EDC split, if you stay within this, it is good. Whereas if your entry is little anterior and if you are going like a Kaplan approach, then you will end up with, definitely you will end up seeing the radial nerve. So even otherwise, if your dissection skills are good enough, there should not be any problem. And also keep it in pronation. When you are keeping it in pronation, you will try to stay away from the radial nerve. But keep, keep, keep in mind about the four centimeter distance and also make sure that you are keeping it in pronation, then you are generally safe in these approaches. One, you can also add, so Roger. Stay on the bone. Stay on yeah. the bone when you're, uh, when you're dissecting to the neck. Um, th this, um, I'm fishing for an, uh, for an invitation for next year, but um, I love to do low profile fixation. So I don't use plates, generally don't use plates. And uh, do the, uh, you, you mentioned it during your talk where you have some extra fragments and you put a diagonal screw in. Yeah. I tend not to use plates and do the, I think Dr. Mori called the tripod fixation. Tripod fixation. And um, so I try to avoid um, uh, plates and, and, then that, and then you avoid the radial nerve, obviously, uh, immediately. So those but, are uh, headless screws or a small yeah. fragment screw? Is it yeah, headless, headless, or head, headless, headless screws. screws? Headless screws. Yeah, same here. But there's nothing wrong with small fragment screws. If you were, but you have to bury them under the, under the surface. So if they're not buried, they become a problem because they, they, they can back out. They can, uh, they can protrude a little bit. And I, um, maybe I missed it, but I always suture the annular ligament after the case, at the end of the case. I always suture it because it's, it's an integral part of the LCR complex. And if you cut the, LCR, the, the annular ligament on lateral or posterior, it doesn't really matter. If you cut the lateral ligament, you will lose stability on the outside, on the, on the lateral side. And uh, so I always suture it. And I also think it acts like a brace. You know, it acts like, like a brace to support your, uh, your fracture fixation. So uh, that's something that I, that I always do. One more question is there from the delegates. Is there any anterior approach for coronoid? Yes. Over the top Hodgkiss approach is the anterior approach. So, okay. So well, there, is, there is a full anterior approach as well that you can use for coronoid or, or uh, um, capitella fracture. And I remember uh, this is a bit of internal kitchen in our hospital was my vacation. And our hand surgeon who's a very, very good surgeon uh, um, well, a fracture came in and he said, wow, I fixed it through an anterior approach. It was excellent. I could see everything. He was very, very happy. And then three months later or six months later, I ended up doing an astrolysis because it was so stiff. So, um, That's the main issue. I think the questions, uh, there are no more questions in the chat box. We can go with, sorry, uh, seven, uh, a lot of time. Can we go with a single case presentation? From, yeah. Um, Professor Sundar Vodigan. Is there any one good yeah. case of your... Uh, in the meantime, sir, really, sir, uh, in uh, India, we don't have a uh, good coronary plates. Uh, and so, so how, do you manage with, uh, how do you manage such big, huge uh, coronary fractures when you don't I, have... Uh, I use some fascia maxillary set plates. But the screws are only 16 mm. Oh. They're not long enough. Uh, oh, that is sufficient. So, I don't see any reason for... Suppose when there is a one, one screw, you can put a, like a 3.5 screw system. But the remaining, you can also use these plates. They're, they're flexible plates and then multiple shapes are there. You can use any of them. So. Yeah, Zimmer has a small yeah. fragment screws, I think, available. Small fragment set of Zimmer has long screws also. It's malleable. It's expensive, like, yeah, those are expensive. I mean, yeah, it's expensive. <laughs> yeah, Professor Roger, you want to say something? No, we, we, you can use finger plates as well. You know, little T plates have been used in the past. And you don't need to use uh, uh, anatomical plates. They're, they're, I, I agree, they're very expensive. 
they're sometimes difficult to use. And uh, I found that even in anatomical plates, I end up bending, bending them anyway. So um, you can use whatever you want. And, and if it's a very big fragment, just use only screws instead of a plate. Professor Rodivel, you want to share your case? Anyone yeah. would please, please share your case. Yeah. I'll start sharing. Okay. So. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So at the outset, I wish to thank the intense session which has been going on and thank the OSS TraumaCon entire team for the, so far having good uh, session. So let me share some, uh, I thought I'll share two uh, cases, so depending upon. So the panelists, Professor uh, Amarnath Surat and Dr. Subin. Uh, so we have been discussing about a lot of complicated cases. I thought that we'll uh, see what are the things which you can see in the X-ray. So can we have uh, for the younger uh, elbow surgeons? So what are the things we look in the X-ray? So, so any of the panelists would like to take? Yeah, so, it so it's an uh, elbow AP and lateral view. So in the AP view, you can find there is a radial fracture and there is double shadow around the, uh, around the capitulum. On the lateral view, looks like there is a capitulum fracture, radial head fracture, elbow is subluxated. And coronoid, there is a doubtful coronoid fracture. So at going for a terrible try, something like that. More than terrible try. So, yeah. There is also, so, it is capitulum also is broken and also trochlea also is impacted. So I think so. Trochlea, yeah. Yeah, so the double arc which they are mentioning in the AP view is the capitulum because this double shadow which says, yeah. but the trochlea is also not normal. We can see that there's a step off. And this is a double arc sign which has been described. So if there is a double arc which we are seeing, then it means that the, in addition to the capillum, there is also a trochlear okay. uh, fracture. Yeah, so it is uh, more of a, a partial articular fracture. So these are the CT images. So how do you like to approach this uh, fracture? And uh, what are the implants you would like to have? So the approach for this fracture and what are the implants you would like to have? So the panelists. Maybe I can take. Maybe I can yeah. take this. Yeah. Um, I would choose yeah. a combined combined medial and lateral approach for this. Um, it needs to be reduced perfectly, and um, I use headless screws if I can from anterior to posterior to fix this um, um, distal humerus fracture. If it's an elderly person, then uh, for me, uh, my threshold to go through a, go to a hemi prosthesis or prosthesis would be would be low. But in, you know, in this case, uh, with a younger person, I would, uh, I would definitely try to fix it. And then the radial head separately with, um, with the radial, uh, just with the same headless screws. So you'd like to approach both medially and laterally, or you'd like to first see the lateral approach, uh, EDC well, split or the capital. I, I will always start on the lateral side and, um, and see how far I can get. But in this case, because it, you know, in a normal capital shear fracture where you have one big piece and you reduce it, that's easy. But this piece is also broken in two, and then and then the medial uh, uh, the medial yeah. trochlea also fractured. So I would I would definitely well let's say ninety nine percent sure I would go post I would go medial and lateral uh, with two separate incisions. In the beginning of my career, I was trained uh, partly by uh, Greg Bain from Australia, and he always used the posterior incision to do that. So in the beginning of my career, I always used posterior incision. Big medial flaps, big lateral flaps, um, but gradually I've gone to uh, two separate incisions and had less problems with uh, with soft tissue swelling. So, any other difference of opinion? Then, then you want to? No, it is the same. Like lateral approach, I'll go and then then see. Yeah. But because, as he said, the, the uh, trochlear management might become difficult, so you may have to open on the medial side because it's an impacted fracture. When you are bringing it out the positioning becomes a little difficult. So you'll have to see it clearly. So I think okay. medial approach also may be needed or direct anterior approach also sometimes is very useful in this. Uh, that Red was telling that uh, it might produce more stiffness. So I just went through the lateral approach. So it is a partial articular capillary and trochlear shear fracture, the approach and the implants. It is mostly only the headless screws which we need to keep. So mm -hmm. I just went through the EDC split and uh, from lateral approach I went, I did not go medially. 
but i could get the trochlear right and then i could uh, fix the capitulum also capitulum was uh, comminuted so i had to use a lot of screws but i could get the joint congruous and uh, so the take home will be analyze the fracture lines fragments you should plan for your exposure so if lateral approach you are not able to expose the fragment and get adequate reduction we need to have a, we must be prepared for the medial approach also and have because uh, we are uh, so many of us will not be uh, endowed with all the implants off the shelf so you may have to order everything so just some plates and few of the screws may not be enough so you have to have the entire armamentarium to address this uh, fractures so if there is time just one more uh, is it possible just to discuss one more case what we will close okay. i'm saying i think we are out of time so i think uh, okay, you should right. go through fast or it's okay yeah yeah i'll go through this is just a non union i just want to say because i'll not ask for the opinion <laughs> i'll just finish off so the issues are the small distal fragment osteoporosis and the joint stiffness is one which the younger colleagues must understand so the movement is taking place at the sudo process and uh, we must get a good uh, range of movement so otherwise if you just fix that then we might end up with the joint becoming very stiff so the principles of management will be the clearance of the soft tissue you have to adequately clear and mobilize the uh, mobilization of the distal fragment before we go in for a fixation so the arthrolysis is very important that is the lna posterior approach so arthrolysis is imp important and compression at the uh, uh, non union site of course like any other non union the metaphyseal non union you have to mobilize the distal fragment for a stable fixation so this is the fixation what you can get and if the distal fragment is very uh, small then we can go ahead with the modification of the uh, fixation like a double tension bandage so thank you thank you so much for the opportunity once again for the organizers thank you thank you sir thank That's you so much uh, now i ask uh, uh, neen kutti to do the closing remarks anyway we are we had a great session this yeah. evening uh, and uh, uh, i i would like to thank first of all the president of oasis to for being here and uh, the i am not taking much of time the foreign faculty was excellent uh, i am of macky and van right professors thank you all and all those also the national faculty you have done justice to and uh, the a uh, lot of people are uh, logged in 225 people were there and most of them are still there uh, so excellent session and i thank the karnataka team the bangalore team from by uh, maligarjan sir thank you for taking up this uh, job very, very late uh, within a month you could organize such a great program and thank you all and thank you uh, all delegates for uh uh logging in thank you all i think uh, you should thank our young tech dr omshi has put his lot of his effort yes, behind yes. the scene and front everywhere and thank for the opportunity given to us by our koa team and dr nitanand rao our vice president and ko president uh, dr chandrashekar and oss team also i uh, once again i thank all the overseas uh, uh, faculty and uh, our national faculty one and all good night thank you we'll meet some other time in some other occasions yes uh, thank you very much for we'll have an oasis icl also ju in july last maybe 25th of july all 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 please join us again thank you thank you karnataka team excellent show thank you very much thank you sir sir nitanand rao sir you want to head on anything nothing nothing fine um, Thank you all. Thank you sir. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.